In the scene that kicks off the tale, Prince Oscar leads a subordinate named Laser to the vicinity of a dragon soaring the skies and the young servant pleads to go back home, fearing certain death. However, Oscar reminds him that a retreat now would thwart all efforts to escape the castle. Meanwhile, Laser fears the witch might cast another curse on his highness, but Oscar has no choice, for he has yet to gather any clues to reverse his dreadful condition, even after 15 years of searching. Thus, he remains steadfast in the quest for the Blue Moon Witch to uncover how to break his curse. If that fails, they'll have to find the one responsible for the spell, the Witch of Silence. This is the story of a witch residing in a blue tower and a royal prince afflicted by a curse. In this narrative, everything could be rewritten, making us ponder what we'd change if we could turn back time. As they open the gate, the two notice everything matches the records, suggesting the walls of this place indeed harbor dark challenges, and whoever overcomes them all to reach the top will have their wish granted by the witch. Since it's an extremely perilous journey, the prince asks the servant to wait below, promising to return before sunset, but the youth refuses to leave his master alone in this place. On the second floor, the nobleman approaches a massive stone plaque with inscriptions, and Laser warns about the snakes surrounding the floor. However, Oscar assures him they'll be fine because they're not venomous and tackles the first challenge, showcasing an ancient mathematical theory, studied about 100 years ago in a small eastern nation, famous for never being solved. However, that's in the past as the theory was resolved 10 years ago, so Oscar presents the answer and the first plaque disintegrates. Laser asks once again if it wouldn't be better to leave now, but the prince is starting to enjoy the challenge until a magic circle appears beneath them, absorbing them both. At the top of the tower, Latola, a servant of the Blue Moon Witch, informs her mistress that the first challengers in a long time have arrived. Last month, a traveler ran out of time after failing to solve the first stone plaque, so as few challengers have been arriving, the servant wonders if the mistress would like to observe these ones, but she prefers to wait for them to climb on their own and instructs Latola to do her job if the adventurers fail. Alone, the witch reflects that the vast majority progresses quickly until they lose their lives to the first guardian beast. Meanwhile, Prince Oscar cuts a beast in half, assuming it was animated by magic, hence not real. Laser comments that the prince's lack of fear is making him even more afraid, but Oscar remains calm in the face of circumstances. Pressing forward, he approaches the edge and questions if he would die if he fell, and Laser grows increasingly scared by his master's behavior. Advancing through the vast staircase, the boy believes they have reached the halfway point of the tower, and Oscar takes the opportunity to remind him that his great-grandfather was the last to reach the top 70 years ago. Laser knows this tale when ten men made the climb and only King Regius, reading at the time, reached the summit. Catching on, Oscar believes he'll follow in his great-grandfather's footsteps to the end of this tower. Thus, they reach a door guarded by two opposing stone gargoyles, so the monarch draws his sword suspecting the monsters might come to life. Oscar shows less patience with his servant's nerves and orders him to go back, when finally the creatures manifest and attack the prince. Oscar uses his serenity to stay calm and study the enemy's movements and dodging the first attack, he retaliates with a precise strike that cleaves one of the gargoyles in half. At that moment, Latola alerts the mistress that the challengers have reached the gargoyle room. The witch asks how many there are and Latola replies two, but in practice only one. The mistress is brewing tea for them, although she believes they won't arrive to enjoy it, yet Latola asserts with conviction that this challenge will be overcome, causing a genuine surprise in the witch. Finally, Oscar wrenches his sword from the eye of the last gargoyle and cuts down the statue, ending the skirmish. This time, he realizes he's reached a stage where taking a blow could cost his life, but that doesn't deter him from continuing his journey. However, before moving on to the next level, the floor of the chamber begins to disintegrate, separating the master from his servant, and as the ground gives way towards the young boy, Lazar asks the prince to continue without him, revealing he eagerly awaits the day Oscar will become king. Then the floor supporting Laser finally collapses, taking the lad into the shadows of an endless abyss. With no way to prevent the fall, the future king turns and maintains the determination to reach the top, opening the door to the next stage of the tower. This time, the chamber bears no resemblance to the rooms that once held stone demons until Oscar spots a table with a teapot. At that moment, a mysterious figure invites the man to sit with her, introducing herself as Tinasha, although nobody calls her by her true name. Oscar asks if she's the witch, due to her youthful appearance, but Tanisha finds it impolite to question a witch's appearance. Soon, she informs him that his companion is sleeping downstairs without any injuries. He asks if she used magic to alter his appearance, but Tanisha is offended again by these personal questions. Oscar argues that the woman is hundreds of years old, and he sees no wrinkles on her, 
So the witch explains her body doesn't bear the marks of time at the pace of humans, and her body simply stopped aging, for example. Changing the subject, Tanisha wants to know the name of this brave warrior who was the first to ascend to the top of the tower practically alone. So the man apologizes for the rudeness and introduces himself as Oscar Leth, Herr Prince of the Farsa's royalty, great-grandson and descendant of King Regius. Impressed, Tanisha notes Oscar's resemblance to the ancient king, although she finds the ancestor's face more welcoming. Oscar laments not showing his emotions, but the witch laughs at the formality and replies that at least the young prince is more handsome, although Reg was a pure soul with a childlike side. Finally, Oscar shows a feeling of surprise upon seeing the witch mention his great-grandfather by nickname, while Tanisha introduces her servant, Latola, who recounts that the prince's companion is sound asleep outside the tower due to the spell she cast. Concerning this, Oscar believed that the witch buried men who couldn't climb a common grave, but once again, Tanisha is offended by the insinuation that she lives surrounded by a cemetery. In reality, she aims to avoid flooding her home with bodies, thus ensuring not to kill any visitors. Rightly so, the prince argues that the claws of those gargoyles are enough to tear any man apart, so she reveals that she sends challengers to the ground floor at the exact moment of the fatal blow, and those who fail have their memories manipulated and are thrown into random corners of the continent. According to Tanisha, most adventurers seek only honors and glories, and this is a fair price to pay for their excessive attachment to these things. On the other hand, Latola explains that some challengers face the deadly dangers of the tower in search of a cure for their sick children. And to these people, her mistress demonstrates a kindness as noble as her ambitions. Curious about this mysterious behavior, Oscar would like to know if the witch usually visits the nearby cities, but Tanisha has no interest in interfering in human lives, vulgarizing the real purpose of her gift with spells. In turn, Oscar laments that the Witch of Silence does not share the same thought since it was she who cursed the prince. That night, she went up to the king's room to make both the father and the son sterile, rendering them unable to produce hairs, because royal blood now corrodes every woman they touch, extinguishing the Farsis lineage after Oscar's death. To this day, the prince doesn't know the reason for suffering this curse, as his father refused to comment on it, but he believes it's related to his mother, who died before this. Since then, Oscar has always sought a cure for this spell in the books and ruins that permeate the land of men. But no clue has ever been found, and in the search for answers, the prince reached the top of this tower. Tanisha makes it clear that there is no guarantee that a curse can be undone, because what witches call magic is organized and operated by a shared set of rules, however, curses follow no law. Furthermore, clear words must be imbued to break the spell. So if the curse's breaking is indefinite when it is cast, not even the caster can do anything. To make matters worse, Tanisha comments that curses are not usually so powerful, and they always indirectly hit the target, so Oscar must actually be suffering from a variant of the blessing. To prove her point, the witch touches the man's face and displays the mark of the blessing imposed on him. Interestingly, a blessing can be used for evil purposes. For example, that witch imposed such a powerful protection on all fetuses generated by the farces that no human woman is capable of bearing. Tanisha assures that there are magics to alleviate this blessing, but the Witch of Silence is so powerful that she sealed this spell with 20 layers of protection, hiding the cure in a veritable minefield. Therefore, Oscar must find a woman capable of resisting this protective power of the child. So Tanisha looks for this person based on the prince's magical power and resistance. He asks what to do if this woman is married, elderly, or a child, and Tanisha humorously makes it clear that the married one will have to betray, while the elderly, with a little help from magic, can be the old pot that cooks good food. As for the child, following the traditions of human kingdoms, they are usually shaped by the man until becoming an ideal woman for the next 20 years or so. However, the man is afraid of having to date a walking mummy, so he questions whether Tanisha herself would be able to resist the power of the blessing on her body. Innocently, she confirms yes, and seeing where this guy is getting at, the witch asks for calm at this moment, but soon Oscar says that his wish is to leave this tower with Tanisha as his wife. The woman refuses without thinking twice, but Oscar reminds her that she would do everything possible to grant his wish, and moreover, she herself said that she would find a way if she were elderly. Tanisha is enraged at being called old, but the issue isn't that. It's that this prince is simply trying to introduce witch blood into the royal lineage. Faced with this madness, Tanisha comments that her great-grandfather made this same insane proposal 70 years ago, but Oscar remains firm in his proposition, not backing down at all. Seeing that the man wouldn't back down, Tanisha threatens to erase the prince's memory and dump him at the corner of Neverland, so Oscar prepares to retaliate. However, the witch notices that the adventurer carries with him the royal sword Akashia, the only one in the world immune to magic. With no chance against her natural enemy, Tanisha sits back upon encountering the weapon of dialogue. 
Back at the table, the two stare at each other like two lions in a jungle, until Oscar comments that Tanisha lived in Farsa's castle semi years ago from what he heard. Witch replies that she stayed there for a year and a half teaching magic and cultivating flowers. Faced with this, Oscar asks for just one year with the witch in his kingdom as his final wish as the winner. Finally, the Witch of the Blue Moon accepts to leave her tower as the protector of the Farsa's prince, while Lazar wakes up outside muttering his wish to leave this place. At that moment, Oscar appears and introduces his companion as the witch's pupil, responsible for helping to remove the curse. Laser whispers in the prince's ear why the witch of this tower didn't eat him alive, so Oscar asks back if this boy isn't afraid of death. Then the group sets off and the entrance to the tower is sealed, while Tanisha makes it clear that Oscar can ask whenever he wants for something to be completely burnt. Oscar says it won't be necessary because all that matters is her being by his side. By the way, he allows the witch to stay longer in Farsis if she wishes, but Tanisha replies that this won't be necessary either. As they settle into Oscar's house at Farsa's castle, Tanisha grants the prince a blessing that nullifies all external attacks, whether physical or magical. As long as she remains alive, no other human can break this spell. Oscar considers it almost like cheating, and the witch responds that making a pact with a witch itself is cheating. However, the man is still vulnerable to poisons and psychological attacks. Oscar jokes that this spell isn't too bad for an apprentice mage and Tinasha mentions that that's what they'll think she's within this palace, while in fact, she works to break Oscar's curse. He remarks that she could work to marry him, but the girl replies that they've already talked about that. Later, near the training courtyard, she comments to Laser how complicated it is for Oscar not to have a successor, and she questions if there's no one else from the royal lineage, even if from a secondary family. In response, Lazar tells her that 15 years ago, there were a series of cases where babies disappeared throughout the kingdom, when all of Prince Oscar's cousins vanished. As a result, there was no royal member younger than him left. Meanwhile, while lighting a cannibal chandelier, the mage Cav asks Sylvia if she had the same luck, but the girl is struggling to do the same until she breaks the chandelier holder and Tinasha has to help. Sylvia is impressed by the spell without recitation from that woman, while Cav comments that the prince brought that person from the witch's tower. After helping Laser with loading the books, Tinasha stops to observe sword training in the courtyard and asks who the two dueling are. Laser tells her they are General Owls and Officer Meridina, and that this young general is recognized as the most skilled of all, even though Prince Oscar is stronger than him. Tinasha didn't expect anything else from a man who conquered her tower, and to the servant's surprise, she soon descends to personally practice sword against the general. During the fight, Alls lets out some nervous laughs for not believing that a simple amateur could be so efficient, that he comments that if she stopped being a mage, she would be very useful on the front line. After the duel, Alice comments to Officer Meridina that it's clear the prince didn't bring this woman just because he likes her. Meridina heard that she is the witch's apprentice and considers that to be a problem, so the general jokes that jealousy doesn't suit the girl, who gets back at the boy for the tasteless joke. Speaking of witch's apprentice, coincidentally, Latola appears in the courtyard of Farsa's castle in search of the mistress, and she is happy that Tanesha has found a good person for the pact and is having so much fun, but there is something she would like the witch to know. Shortly after, Tanesha enters the prince's office in battle attire and warns that she will be absent for two or three days. Oscar comments that he made a pact and can't be separated from the girl, so he asks her to at least inform where she's going. When she explains that she's traveling to the magical lake in Druza, Lazar enters despair because it was there where the demonic beast was sealed by the witch 70 years ago. Tinasha remembers that well and also knows that in that area, large surges and waves of high magical power haunt the place. Her intention is to discover who is responsible for this and what he is plotting. In this case, Oscar wants to go along with qualified soldiers, even though Tinasha promised to ensure the prince's safety only. That said, the witch gives him an hour to organize his departure. Meanwhile, at the magical lake, Vault observes the heavy fog awaiting something that is not visible, but is about to begin. He hopes that the Witch of the Blue Tower will notice soon. The girl beside him questions if this witch will really come to such a distant place, but Vault has no doubts because she has eyes all over the continent and is in search of the same thing he is. An hour later, the preparations were completed and Sylvia is enchanted by the dragon on Tinasha's shoulder, so she introduces herself to the witch and tries to touch the beast, but it seems she's not in the mood. Oscar asks why she's taking a dragon, and she replies that she intends to ride it if she goes alone. The prince comments that this monster doesn't seem big enough for that, and then informs the expedition group that the goal is to investigate the magical lake in Druza, and that no one should contradict Tinasha's orders. The soldiers are confused by this statement, and Tinasha asks if it's right to say that, but Oscar maintains his posture. Before the departure, the witch hears her name being said from a deep echo, 
then the world around her loses color along with her companions who disappear. Alone, she analyzes the life she chose for herself, where everyone around her are grains of sand that fade with time, but she remains immune to the passage of years, always in the same place. After that, things return to normal and Oscar seems to notice something strange about his fiancée, but prefers to let it go. Soon, they all teleport to Unirite Fortress, northwest of Pharsis on the border with Druza. General Owls points to the cloud of magical power on the horizon, then the group sets off on their mission to the magical lake. Seventy years ago, the neighboring nation Druza invaded Pharsis, and even though Pharsis had a well-prepared and equipped army, Druza had up its sleeve a magical weapon that could decide the course of the war, a gigantic demonic beast. When released, the beast devastated everything around it, whether enemies, allies, or the land itself. In the end, the beast was sealed by the Witch of the Blue Moon, however, the miasma that the monster exhaled poisoned the land, killing everything around it, until it turned the territory into an arid desert. Walking in those surroundings, Oscar feels as if he's in a nightmare, heading towards a demon amidst a dark cloud. According to Tinasha, this demon was a formidable opponent. She remembers that her option was to seal him, since there were many humans around. If she continued to fight, the result would be catastrophic. Suddenly, Tinasha stops in her tracks and commands someone to show up because she knows he's present. With that, the soldiers go on high alert, and everyone hears an evil laughter in the midst of the fog, approaching until it reveals itself as the Magician of Druza. The Magician is delighted to see Tinasha still alive, and with all their stunning beauty, he feels as if he's been transported back seven years ago when he met Miss Blue Moon Witch. Upon hearing the witch's name, Sylvia becomes terrified. While Tinasha mocks the old and worn appearance of the Druza sorcerer because back then, he was just a kid. The magician acknowledges that he's not in his prime of beauty, but unfortunately, not everyone can maintain a pretty face like the witch. Tinasha comments that the man looks just like her former mentor, whom she cut off, and since the magician seems proud of it, she promises to cut him off too to become even more similar to her master. Facing the threat, the old man retreats, knowing he stands no chance against the witch, but he makes it clear to everyone present that they should leave as soon as possible. However, if they refuse, he can convince them by bringing a death or two. Along with this, the wizard invokes a magic that shoots projectiles at the expedition group as if it were a rain. Oscar repels some magical arrows using his sword, but part of the team is killed instantly. Meridina was about to be hit, but the prince absorbs the magical projectile using his immunity granted by the witch. Meanwhile, Tanasha keeps her word and beheads the Druza magician, but he releases his own head as if it didn't belong to him and leaves laughing. After the escape, Tanasha explains that the old man is one of the magicians who controlled the beast, and that this surge of magical power is probably the result of trying to revive this creature, an attempt at revenge 70 years after its defeat. At this point, Tanesha heals one of the allies and Sylvia questions if she really is a witch, but instead of answering, she gives a gentle smile and asks Oscar if he intentionally let the enemy magic hit his hand. Oscar recalls that the attacks don't affect him, leaving Meridina frightened, but the witch still seems concerned. Although she didn't answer, Tanesha sees that the expedition group couldn't do anything but look at her with a strange look, so she sees no way out but to apologize for keeping this secret. Sylvia seems frightened and tries to downplay the situation for Tanesha, but she takes the young woman's hand and explains that witches are indeed something to be feared, so Sylvia shouldn't feel bad. Next, Oscar announces a temporary retreat to rethink his strategy in light of the facts that Tinasha wants to go after the magician alone because the enemy will do everything to revive the beast after discovering the presence of Farsa's soldiers. However, once again, Oscar insists on accompanying the woman because he doesn't want her to do all the dirty work for him alone. After all, the target of these Druza remnants is still the kingdom of Farsis. On the other hand, the witch acknowledges that the man is persistent but reminds him that the pact they seal is only for a year, and in this brief period, she will fulfill her promise, and as long as she is Oscar's protector, she will always come back to him, no matter what she does or where she goes. Thus, Oscar releases the woman's hand and allows her to leave, and she reveals the true form of her dragon, Nark, by using the immense beast as a mount. Oscar asks if Tinasha would like to marry him when they return, but she gets nervous and leaves, saying that talking about these things brings bad luck before the fight. Meanwhile, the Magician of Druza hurries the other sorcerers to break the seal quickly, but the control spell is not yet ready. The old man warns that the intruders are about to arrive, so the magicians strive to finish the work as soon as possible. The old man becomes excited about the imminent return of the demon because then he will finally be able to restore Druza's power. But Tinasha had already arrived and executes each of the sorcerers mercilessly, except for one. She questions if his intention was to undo the seal, and she immediately takes on the responsibility of doing it for him. Thus, she invokes her own spell and frees the beast, 
But despite that threatening presence, Tinesha orders Nark to stay back while she deals with the problem. Soon Tinesha provokes the demon by asking if the sleep was good during those 70 years, and the giant wolf becomes enraged upon recognizing who imprisoned him all that time, then attacks with devastating magic. Tinesha retaliates with her own spell, but the beast's thick skin absorbs the impact without problems. Then the witch and the beast engage in an epic battle, and Tinesha uses her agility to swiftly navigate the beast's most vulnerable points and emit magical focuses that are subsequently used as explosives. Although she inflicted wounds on the wolf with the explosion, it regenerates instantly. But Tanisha uses these magical focuses to recite a spell that refers to the seven shackles on the beast's body, which must sleep in the cave of ignorance it rejected. This time, Tanisha needs to kill the demon, so she continues reciting the spell to eliminate it, but the wolf bites into the witch's torso as she tries to finish her spell. Awaiting the outcome of the battle at Fort Uride, Oscar sees Nark arriving from the battle across the horizon until the dragon delivers the witch with her belly cut open. Later, Oscar and Nark wait for the results of the examination and soon Sylvia informs them that she found no serious injuries because apparently Tinisha herself closed the open belly. Thus, the prince rushes to see how the woman is, but she tells him to leave the room until she finishes dressing. After that, she explains that she suffered severe damage to her organs, but she recovered by accelerating her body's growth. Because of this growth, she will return to her previous appearance. Finally, Oscar thanks the woman for saving everyone on the expedition, and she responds that it was nothing. After all, she was a witch. The next day, Tinesha was caressing her familiar, which soon flew off the balcony. Shortly after, Sylvia enters the witch's room to serve coffee and sees her with a knife ready to cut her hair. The mage panics and asks to cut the woman's hair instead of her doing such a crazy thing. During the act, Tinesha questions if Sylvia isn't afraid of a witch like her. And the mage even acknowledges that witches are scary because, according to records, there are five of them in the world, and one night they together destroyed a nation in one night. However, Sylvia believes that Tinesha wouldn't do that, and this belief made the human change her perception of these sorceresses. On the other hand, when asked, Tinesha confesses that she got fear she didn't know how to deal with in the past, but that diminished after so many years of life. Currently, she hates being forced to go to bed, and she also bothers with the fact that she never knows what Oscar is thinking and that sometimes it seems like he thinks of Tinasha as a cat he took off the streets. After having her hair cut, the Blue Moon Witch is introduced to the King of Farsis, Kevin, as the prince's future wife, even though she insists on denying this information, correcting that she's there to remove Oscar's curse. Since she needs time to analyze a way to do this, she's staying at the castle. Oscar comments that she will have to take full responsibility if she fails, and this makes Tinasha start to rant again in front of the king, who comments to Laser how well this couple gets along. Meanwhile, the mysterious Vault and Miralise continue around the magical lake of Druza, and Vault believes it was lucky that the Blue Moon Witch suffered a serious injury when defeating the demon because that gave them a chance to possess this red stone. Out of nowhere, another man appears, saying he thought he was dealing with a local dog, but it seems that girl already took care of that. Vault replies that she has been looking for the green-eyed mage for a long time, but he understands that he must seek the witch at the right time after all, she wanted to see him all this time. Vault emphasizes that in all stories, this man treats the witch very badly, but when the green Eye mage questions where he got that from, Vault doesn't go into details and says he's just a mere spectator. However, the mage mentions that the guy seems to have his own plans, so Vault explains that the only purpose of his clan is to help bring about events that are about to happen, nothing more than that. Nevertheless, the mage does not allow the departure of the duo because the witch is special to him and no interference will be allowed. That said, Vault casts a spell to protect Miralis, but he is hit by a spell that disintegrates his body. Meanwhile, in the Bile Forest, northeast of Farsus, Oscar takes Lazer to the place where the incident occurred. As always, Lazar appears apprehensive because nine villagers ended up dead there, and their bodies were found dry and wrinkled. However, that's why the cause needs to be discovered as soon as possible, in the prince's opinion. Taking advantage of Tinisha's absence, Oscar will have more freedom to act as he pleases, but he has to avoid being attacked so the witch isn't alerted to the damage to his protege's defensive barrier. Walking a little further, Laser shows his master a pearl growing from a plant, and the nobleman can't believe how naive the boy is. Soon the plants with pearls grow and one tries to strangle Laser, but Oscar saves the young man. Neither of them knows this plant, but they suppose that they are the ones causing all this harm by sucking the water from the prey's bodies. That said, Oscar aims at the largest of the plants and pierces it with his sword. The supposed pearl explodes and releases a strange poisonous purple liquid, and shortly after, another different plant releases a toxin that makes Laser faint. Before he could reach the boy, 
Oscar is approached by a woman who wants to know what they are doing in this forest. Hours later, Laser wakes up in a nice house in the middle of the afternoon, and his master calms the servant, informing him that the woman gave him an antidote. Laser doesn't understand who he's talking about until the girl herself appears introducing herself as Lucrezia, although she is better known as the Witch of the Forbidden Forest. After giving the boy another dose of the antidote, she laughs when she sees him coughing as he ingests the substance, and then she asks Oscar if Tinasha is still the same. After all, only Tinasha would be able to cast a defensive barrier like the one she detected on the prince, so Oscar tells her that she's acting as his protector, and Laser adds that his master was able to defeat the witch's tower alone. Impressed, Lucrezia asks if the warrior wished to be the king of the whole world as a prize, but Laser interrupts and says that in fact the prince asked to marry the Blue Moon Witch. In the midst of her laughter, Lucrezia adds that Tinasha is a spiritual sorceress, and that wizards of this type are the only ones who should remain pure, since mixing souls during that act drastically increases the power needed to perform spiritual magic. Despite this, the power of the Blue Moon Witch is so great that it wouldn't make a difference, so it would be good for her to try to get married someday. Thus, she decides to help the prince in this quest for love, though the spell that was not revealed. As tensions were starting to grow in the room, Lezer suggests they leave for now, and Oscar embraces the idea. The next day, back at the castle, Tinesha asks if they encountered any problems in her absence. The two pretend that nothing happened, and Lazar swiftly changes the subject, while Oscar announces that he's going out. As he passes the witch, she seems to notice something strange, although Oscar disagrees. After that day, the prince woke up as usual in the early morning, and Tinesha was at the door of the man's room asking if he slept well. Oscar says yes, but his vision is blurred with fatigue, and he projected the vision of the second Tinasha, leaving the original one calling his name. Even in the face of visible discomfort, Oscar insists that there's nothing wrong with his sleep, so Tinasha decides to give up questioning the noble. Unable to extract anything from the man, she turns to his servant, then approaches Laser to inquire about the master's sleep. However, the boy doesn't know much whether the prince sleeps in boxers or spooning with two pillows, so he doesn't have much to add. Nevertheless, Tinasha insists on the subject, questioning if Oscar hasn't had any recent affairs, and Laser swears up and down that he hasn't and soon comments that this seems like jealousy. In response, the witch tells the kid to keep that kind of opinion to himself. Later, Tinasha tells her students that Oscar is having an affair because his life force has been fluctuating differently, besides the perfume that can be smelled from afar and therefore he should make it public that he has a lover. Down, one of the magicians from Farsis, remarks that it's not common for someone to go around shouting that they have a lover. Furthermore, he passed by Oscar just now and didn't smell anything. With that said, Tinasha clenches her fist and causes a tremor in the entire room, and soon bids farewell to the pupils, making Doan pity whoever betrays this witch. In no time, Tinasha was already on top of the prince, outraged that he didn't tell her he met Lucrezia. Oscar excuses himself, saying he thought it wasn't important. However, the girl points out that if meeting a witch isn't important, then she's a four-wheeled motorcycle, and reminds him that he's still vulnerable to psychological attacks, therefore, if something goes wrong in that sense, maybe she can't do anything. Fortunately, she found out in time and explains that this is a spell disguised as a lover in the person's dreams, but gradually steals the victim's life force through the intimate relationship, and that there are cases where the victim dies within a week from it. Tanasha discovered this through the strong smell of flowers on the protege's body, like a woman's perfume, and apparently Lucrezia cast this spell in a way that only Tanasha could perceive. Thus, the Blue Moon Witch is willing to remove this spell, but there are risks involved in it. As night falls, Tanasha accompanies Oscar's sleep, who dreams of his entrance into a house with a vast corridor, where at the end there was a staircase leading to an empty expanse, where there was only a bed and Tanasha sitting on it. The two embrace affectionately, but he starts to strangle her against his will, as he tries to stop his impulse. However, Tinasha's voice inside his mind orders him to continue, so Oscar breaks the woman's neck and ends her life. Having done that, the prince wakes up sweating in his own bed, while the real Blue Moon Witch congratulates the protege for the deed, warning that all the life energy stolen by Lucrezia has been returned to him. Still, Oscar rants for having had to eliminate Tinasha, even if not for real. Then the witch replies that as long as he wields the royal sword of Kasia, someday he will have to kill her in real life. Without further explanation, she wishes the prince a good night's sleep and leaves. Without wasting time, Tinesha knocks on Lucrezia's door to demand limits for these sick fetishes. In her defense, the forest witch argues that sick is the way Tinesha broke the curse, with a hanging. The blue moon witch says that was the most effective and fastest way and questions why the other witch did that. To Lucrezia, that was like a little greeting after so long, and as she hands a drink to the old acquaintance, she asks if she could have that handsome man in case the colleague doesn't want him. 
Tinesha tells her to take him if she wants, but quickly retracts remembering it would be bad to introduce another witch's blood in this case. With that, Lucrezia realizes that this is the silent witch's doing and already foresees the work it will take to break this curse. Therefore, as an apology, she passes on to Tinesha Oscar's blood and cream, because according to her, these would be the most affected by the curse. In turn, Tinesha understands that with just one prick you can draw someone's blood, she just doesn't know how many pricks it takes to extract the other substance. Speaking of which, Lucrezia emphasizes that the spell she cast on Oscar didn't stipulate that it should be Tinasha in the dreams, but rather reflected the man's own desires. Faced with this, the Forbidden Forest Witch believes that the prince really likes the colleague. Sometime later, Tinesha meets Oscar in his room and without ceremony he calls her close and puts the girl in his lap next to him on the bed. Then, he apologizes and the witch takes the opportunity to do the same. The next day, Oscar joined the soldiers in the training yard to take part in the activities. After defeating yet another soldier from the regiment, it was General All's turn to step forward against the prince, but he too was overcome without much difficulty by the talented prince of Pharsus. Seeking a greater challenge, the heir to the throne saw Tinnership passing by and invited her to a duel. As she immediately declined, Oscar allowed the use of magic, prompting her to reconsider while questioning whether this man would one day be capable of killing a witch like her. Above all, as she presented herself for the challenge, she demanded that Oscar use the royal Akashia sword in this fight, and so the confrontation finally began. Right from the start, Tinasha cast a spell against her opponent, emanating several energy projectiles, making it very difficult for him to avoid being hit. Seizing this distraction, she attacked the adversary with her swords. After the fight, she healed the Prince of Pharsus, while Meridina learned on that day what it means to use magic in close combat. Alice pointed out that most mages stay in the rear casting spells, but he had never seen one who also took the front line of battle. The officer concluded that the witch was too relaxed in that duel, seeming to teach her opponent, and indeed, Tinasha was delighted when she realized that Oscar could see an invisible magical vine, just before announcing the end of the fight. As she began to receive healing, the prince asked Tinasha if she had taken it easy in the duel, but she considered that the focus required for enchantments demanded a lot of effort, and she deliberately avoided close combat for fear of being defeated. Oscar replied that he did the same because he didn't want to kill the witch, to which she views the human as knave for thinking so. Finally, when he asked if she wished to die, Tinasha replied that she still had to break Oscar's curse before that, and he made it clear that he would prefer to go through all of this married to the witch, who once again refused the request and left. Shortly after, Oscar received a letter from the small nation of Kuskal, to the north, wishing to meet the Blue Moon Witch. The prince wanted to know how they found out about the witch's stay at Farsa's castle, but the king couldn't say. Nevertheless, he tasked the prince with resolving this matter. Soon the envoy from Kuskal appeared in the kingdom, introducing himself as Kaibar and requesting an audience with the Blue Moon Witch. Oscar denied the existence of such a creature in Farsa's territory, but the envoy remained steadfast in his conviction, even provoking by saying he would love to see the 80 witch, which surprised Oscar to hear a different name for Tinisha. Meanwhile, Tinasha is looking for Oscar, so a maid informs her that he is busy at the moment, taking the opportunity to introduce herself as Miralis, saying that she started serving his highness after being recommended by General Eddard. On the other hand, Tinesha senses the energetic aura around the maid and knows the reason she got this position, but asks the girl not to mind her. Later, Lucrezia appears in Farsis and invites Tinesha for tea, during which she questions if Tinesha is trying to die while showing Oscar how to fight because the user of the royal Akashia sword could become a real problem if he gets even stronger. Nevertheless, the Blue Moon Witch herself doesn't know why she felt the urge to duel the prince. Maybe she just wanted someone to kill her. As she grew tired of waiting for that other person who would be capable of it, suddenly Lazar appears with his master to summon the witch for the audience, and when Oscar insists on calling her Eddie, her surprised expression confirms to him that indeed that was her real name. As soon as she meets with the envoy from Kuskal, Tinesha demands not to be called Eddie, and instructs him to get straight to the point. Kagar reveals that the Kuskal Foundation has restored the rights of persecuted mages in Tayiri, so he wants Tinesha to lend her expertise to develop their abilities. However, without showing resentment, Tinasha clarifies that her mission there is to protect the hair of farces, nothing more and nothing less, and orders the man who has never had the honor of ascending her tower to disappear before making such a request of such magnitude. After being expelled, Kagar was sure the witch would accept the request when he called her Eddie, but now he's thinking of a way to separate her from the prince, until he sees Meridina resting in the yard. After the audience, Tinesha meets Lucrezia in one of the castle corridors and asks if she happens to know the nation of Kuskal, a group of mages who proclaimed independence last year. 
Lucrezia is unaware of this new country, but had indeed noticed strange waves of magic emanating from the north, subtle and sporadic fluctuations, as if coming from a lake. In the meantime, Meridina approaches and suddenly attacks the Blue Moon Witch, but when Tinashu was about to retaliate with a stab in the officer's gut, Alls manages to prevent the death of his companion by intervening in time. Faced with the situation, Oscar puts his sword to the general's neck, who cannot explain himself, while Meridina accuses the witch of deceiving men's hearts and therefore should leave this country. This is an accusation that Tinasha has heard many times, although she has never actually done so, and so she becomes saddened and cries, but Lucrezia is certain that the woman is acting this way because she is under mental control. Oscar asks her to reverse the spell, so the Forbidden Forest Witch warns that it won't come cheap, while Tinasha tries to remember the last time she cried. Already lying in her bed, Tinasha hears Lucrezia say that she has already treated the bewitched officer, but the girl doesn't seem to care about that at the moment. The next day, Tinasha invites Oscar to her tower and informs him that she sent a familiar to investigate Cusco. So from now on, she wants the prince to train with her. Without further ado, the first training session between the two takes place right there, at that moment, and after the fight, Tinasha praises the man's performance, who wants to know the reason for all of this. Tinasha explains that she would like Oscar to choose the path he desires among the greatest number of options possible, and so she hopes he will come back for another training session tomorrow. Said and done, the prince returns for another series of duels, and Tinasha was getting heavier with the human, who returned day after day as soon as he finished his official duties. At the end of each training session, the witch healed the man, and they would have tea together. Over time, Oscar was already facing two opponents at once. However, when Tinasha used her invisible vine again, this time the prince couldn't see it and was knocked down. Facing this, Tinasha realizes that mental exhaustion affected the man's perception. He couldn't see what he had seen before in the fight against her in the palace. With that said, Oscar proves the witch's point by fainting on her shoulder, forcing the girl to leave him somewhere. When he wakes up not understanding anything, Oscar leaves where he was left and finds the Blue Moon Witch on the highest balcony of the tower. He touches the witch's waist from behind and asks why she didn't slap him, then Tinasha explains that she expected that from the boy, but if it bothers him, he just needs to control himself. Then she gives him tea with three kilos of sugar to recover his pupil's fatigue, who questions if he can have magical power while getting diabetes by drinking the beverage. The tutor tells the prince that he has magical power, however, he won't be able to use it while wielding the acacia, but he can still see invisible spells like the vine. Thinking about it, the next day, the Tower Witch surrounds Oscar in a circle of fire and tells him to observe the flow of magic and then cut it when he finds the place that acts as the axis of the spell composition. Not understanding much of what was said, Oscar swings his sword around the circle without causing any effect until he stops to analyze the flames around him more deeply. Soon, he sees the axis mentioned by the witch and cuts it with the acacia. Tinasha applauds the human success and considers putting him to fight against others of his kind next. To the tower owner's luck, a group of five adventurers invades the place to conquer the labyrinth, giving Tinasha exactly what she was looking for. Soon, she announces that any wish will be granted to the team if they defeat the man in front of them. And as the team prepares to advance, the witch warns Oscar that she will prevent any deaths, so he can go all out in this fight. With that said, the heir to the throne of Farsas wins the conflict without breaking a sweat, so Tinasha decides to end the training for today. Oscar asks if he would be able to win a duel against the witch now and she replies that it wouldn't be fun if they already knew the answer. At that moment, a familiar cat of the woman returns to the tower with information about Cusco. At dawn, Tinisha returns to Farces and tells the servants Laser and Miralis that the small nation to the north has about 200 spiritual mages and wizards. Impressed, Laser mentions the fact that each country only has an average of 20 to 30 mages, and that's why Oscar considers the possibility of Cusco preparing for a war. Tinisha doesn't deny this risk, as they were seen trying to summon demons, According to Oscar, since that territory is a monarchy, and considering that the current monarch is not the former lord of the lands, the chances of a mage leading the nation are high, so the prince intends to continue investigating. At that moment, Alls interrupts the meeting hastily to warn about General Eddard. After some time, the officers and servants close to Eddard attended his funeral, especially Miralis, who was summoned to the palace precisely because of that man. Sobbing, the young woman remembers how kind he was even though he was a distant relative. As for the prince, he remembers that he is indebted to the deceased, as is Owls because Eddard was responsible for training the young general to the point where he could reach the level he achieved, just as he taught Oscar to be a strong man after he was cursed. Keeping that in mind, Oscar asks Tinoshin not to die before him. 
After the burial, Lazar tells the prince that General Eddard's belongings will be left to the closest relatives and that Owls was informed about His Highness's curse. As marriage would solve the situation, Owls questions what bothers the hare so much that the witch doesn't want to live beside him. Since she didn't expect such a question, the witch becomes confused and doesn't know what to answer, so Lazar suggests it might be his mocking habit. Anyway, whatever it is, Tinasha points out that she still has six months in the palace, and that's enough time to solve this problem. Besides this one, a problem that the witch solved instantly was magically picking up the sugar cubes she dropped. Although the teapot lid wasn't as lucky. Oscar asks if she can fix the lid, so she explains that she can't undo what's broken, and even though she can stop time, she can't make it go back, because apart from a simple teapot, all living things share death as their final destination. In the dead of night, in some dark corner, Kagra begs for his life, while Miralis emphasizes the man's courage in coming there, because his lord killed someone important before her eyes, and even if that lord fixes everything, the sin won't be erased. So as he screams for the name of Lord Lanak, a diabolic beast advances against Kagar, and kills Kuskal's emissary mercilessly. At some point in the past, a man carried Tinasha in his arms while she slept, calling her by the name Eddie as she awakened. According to him, something good is about to happen, and he wanted her to see it too. Eddie feels happy, but still sleepy, she drifts off again until the crucial moment. This time, she wakes up next to Oscar, saying she got a nightmare. To him, this happened because she fell asleep sitting up, so she should watch out for that. Tinasha agrees while lamenting having the same dream again. This morning, the prince was settling kingdom matters when Miralee serves him a mug of tea, which he thanks her for, while also noticing something strange about the girl. Nonetheless, Lazar arrives to announce that the king wants to see Oscar. Upon arrival, the sovereign says he sought advice from Tinasha about his son's future bride. Due to Oscar's curse, his wife must possess a high magical resistance, and the witch recommends Oscar marry Miralee's because she meets this demand. Dissatisfied, the prince questions if the witch knew this for some time and she responds affirmatively, stating that given the circumstances, indeed the servant is a good potential bride because her family transmits magic through lineage and even though her power is sealed, the girl inherited magic from her parents. Oscar is irritated for not being informed earlier, but the king demands silence, stating everyone is striving to do their best for him, so he should focus on getting to know his future bride better. Later, Oscar asks the young woman who was responsible for sealing her magic. Miralees reveals it was her mother, alongside Master Kumu, meaning a double seal. Changing the subject, the prince asks Laser where Tinasha is as it's been a week since he last saw her, but no one knows where the witch went. In fact, she returns to the top of her tower, where at this moment she was having tea with the witch from the Forbidden Forest, Lucrezia. Tinasha tells her friend that Oscar found a candidate to marry, so now she's free from that. Although Lucrezia doubts that the Blue Moon Witch is as relieved as she claims. Suddenly, Latola alerts that a challenger has arrived at the tower, bypassing the closed entrance with teleportation. At the same time, Oscar enters the room impatiently, while Latola informs him that he broke the speed record and had the fewest companions in the challenge. Paying no heed to that, the prince gets straight to the point and questions the witch about why she's hiding. Tinasha replies she's busy trying to break the curse because it's a beautifully complex and delicate composition, requiring time and focus. Seeing the blessing of the silent witch before him, Tinasha concluded that love and hate are two sides of the same coin, and that's scary. Seeing she's indeed busy, Oscar just asks her to appear occasionally to make dinner for him when she can, and the witch agrees. The next day, she was having tea in the Garden of Farsa's castle with Nark, until Alls appears to inform that nothing found in General Eddard's belongings is related to Miralis, not even the girl's past, which he researched, so he doesn't think it wise to nominate her as a princess. Tanasha replies she searched for candidates across the continent, but the only viable ones were the witches and none possessed as much power as Miralis, so the general believes she's hiding something. Faced with this, Tanasha doesn't know how to act because she hasn't found out if she's after the royal family of Farsis or if her intention is to distance the Blue Moon Witch from the kingdom. Speaking of which, the servant passes through the courtyard at this moment, so the two take the opportunity to uncover the truth about her. Thus, they pretend to be having an affair behind a tree, and as soon as Miralee sees the situation and leaves, the guard knows she won't tell the prince anything if she's after him. But if she's after Tinasha, she will. The problem is that it wasn't just the servant who saw this happening. Upon ascending the castle, Miralee sees Oscar storming through the corridor in anger. In a short time, the prince calls Tinasha and asks what she did today. The witch replies she did the usual analyses and tries to touch the prince's face to know why he's upset, but Oscar stops her and puts on her a sealing item with properties similar to Akashia's. After that, he justifies he waited patiently, but even his patience has limits because he didn't bring the witch there to hand her over to another man. 
That said, Oscar picks Tinesha up, reminding her of the dream that repeats so often in her mind, and this terrifies the witch. So she slaps the man's hand and shatters all the glass in his room, and the hair of farces manages to calm the woman before anything worse happens. He admits his intention was just to give her a little scare, and it was in poor taste. Furthermore, he admits he beat up Alls for thinking he was having an affair with Tinasha, engaging in ten consecutive training duels with him. Tinasha explains everything and asks the prince to apologize to the general, but anyway, Oscar doesn't want anyone withholding information about Miralis. Tinasha argues they had no evidence to report, besides she didn't want to ruin any chance of Oscar falling in love with her. That said, Oscar gives the witch a double knock on the head to teach her to share information even without concrete evidence. Later, the heir to the throne of Farces gathers all the nobility to announce that he's not keeping Tinasha in the realm because he has no other choice, but because he likes her. Therefore, it's fugal and undesirable to try to make him fall in love with another woman because he won't choose anyone but her. Tinasha doesn't know where to hide her face while Miralise gets angry at this declaration. Oscar adds that among the thousand options, Tinasha will always be his choice, so it doesn't make sense for her to complicate things. Finally, Oscar dismisses Miralise from her position as his servant to analyze her history, and then he leaves without paying attention to the girl. At that moment, Tinesha notices a weakness in the magical shield of the castle, so she pushes Oscar while Miralis combines their forces. The Blue Moon Witch tries to attack, but the bracelet imposed by Oscar hinders her magic. Therefore, Miralis manages to easily hit Tinesha's eye and shows that Oscar's beloved is in great danger. It seems that the servant broke Kubu's seal alone, if she was telling the truth, but at least the prince removes the bracelet from Tinesha's wrist. She orders Oscar to hide now because her blood's sneeze weakened her personal magical shield, so he must help the others take cover. Anyway, Tinasha will have to fight with only her right eye and, moreover, against the monster that invades the throne room at that time. Tinasha notices that her opponent has regenerated the demonic beast using its core, while Oscar disobeys his loyal friend's orders and takes the lead in the fight wielding the royal Akashia sword. Tinasha does not oppose the man's stubbornness, as long as he ensures an easy and injury-free victory. With that said, the demonic beast advances towards the human, while Tinesha and Miralise exchange spells to determine who will have the advantage in this encounter. Miralise tries to incinerate the opponent's body, but she defends herself with a magical shield and counterattacks, until the wolf prevents her from casting magic. Tinesha realizes that she cannot attack or defend against this animal without enchantments, so she's useless there. Hearing this, Oscar questions what the hell she was doing fighting alone, but Tinesha explains that she could kill the rival witch at any moment, but it would be better to keep her alive to know what she wants. Knowing that she has no chance to confront the Blue Moon Witch, Miralee summons spheres to ensure her safety from a distance. Tinasha throws a magic projectile at the sphere, but the orb distorts the trajectory of the magic. Without thinking twice, Tinasha throws a knife at the enemy's arm, who responds by exploding one of the spheres near her. Given the circumstances, the witch warns Oscar that he has two options. In one, the castle is entirely destroyed, and in the other, the prince will be greatly demanded. Obviously, the man chooses the second alternative, so Tinisha retreats and orders him to stay on the front line. The witch withdraws to begin a powerful enchantment, while Oscar deals with the opponents until then. Miralise threatens to slit the hare's throat, but he reminds her that he spent most of his life without the magical shield protecting him at this moment. With that said, the enemy witch enhances the beast and sends it to occupy Oscar while she attacks Tinasha. Brilliantly, Oscar uses the wolf as a barrier to absorb the impact of the opponent's magic, injuring an important enemy, while defending his ally. Nervous, Miralise turns her attention to the human and distorts the space next to him to win the fight, but Akashi proves superior against the rival's magical attacks. The demonic beast attacks once again, but Oscar manages to shove one of Miralise's spheres into the animal's mouth and devastates it from the inside out. By doing this, Oscar reflects that he needs to get used to facing demons of this caliber if he really wants to stand by Tinasha in this life. Miralis desperately tries to cast another spell to return to the fight, but by this time, Tinasha had already completed her enchantment. Joining her two hands full of dark energy, the Tower Witch imposes overwhelming darkness around the entire throne room, Oscar asks her to remember to get him out of there, and the woman replies that he will not know defeat as long as she is by his side. In the next instant, the darkness dissipates completely, so Tinasha explains that she let the enemy escape on purpose. Meanwhile, Miralee stuns the guards along the way until she finally discovers where what she was looking for is. In the treasure room, she tries to open a white box unsuccessfully, and there was Tinisha to ensure that the opponent does not get what she wants. 
With no escape, the intruding witch screams that Tinisha doesn't understand why she needs that box. She emphasizes that in the future, the Blue Moon Witch will meet the illusion she sought, suffering alone as queen. Trying to escape, the girl is grabbed by Tinasha, and when the white box falls to the ground, a bright red orb comes out of it, making Miralees cry and ask forgiveness from someone named Vault. Soon the orb sucks the witch's soul into itself, with the approval of the witch herself, leaving only her hollow and empty body behind. Observing the scene, Tinasha supposes that Lanak is involved in this, curious, Oscar collects the strangely beautiful magical sphere from the ground. Some time later, Tinisha's eye had fully recovered, and Oscar explains that the orb Miralees was trying to steal did not originally belong to Farsis because it was something that the prince's mother brought, and he doesn't know what it is exactly. With that said, the warrior seems to have a strong headache, but he minimizes the fact and changes the subject, saying that Tinisha did not respond to his entire declaration he made to her earlier. The witch declares that she will never marry and that the man should give up. The nobleman responds that he can wait and pulls her onto his lap, while the woman reflects alone that Oscar may see only one option, but she intends to make him see several until he forgets that, so that the darkness she seeks in her past does not reach Oscar and affect the path he decides to tread. Then Tinesha warns that she's sleepy and Oscar agrees, inviting her to sleep with him, and the witch threatens to teleport the guy straight to his room. Inside, she wishes for the day when they both let go of their hands to come soon. The next day, in some distant place, Lanak, the king of Kuskal, watched his city ablaze and reminisced about the Age of Darkness, the time when he was born. In his view, a new era is about to dawn on the continent with the fall of the four great nations. Meanwhile, Tanasha works on her antidote for the Prince of Farsas until her familiar informs her that someone has returned, and the witch wonders why this return is happening after 400 years. As Mag falls, she reflects on people's ability to kill others for emotions or power. If that's the consequence of these feelings, the witch prefers to isolate herself from love and hatred. Even as she shields herself in a bubble, the mistress of the tower is engulfed in a madness she can't escape. Facing Oscar, she casts a spell on the unconscious man. When morning comes, the prince wakes up with a strange mark on his body, so he wakes Tinesha seeking explanations. She explains that she placed another curse in the same spot as the other, as a form of compensation. In other words, the Blue Moon Witch broke the hare's curse to the throne. She used her own blood as a catalyst and now advises Oscar can wash it off. Oscar grabs the woman's wrist and thanks her, and she smiles and magically disappears. Later, she gets irritated having to attend King Kevin's party, because it's surely another one of those unbearable diplomatic balls. The prince argues that there's no one more suited than her for this occasion, and wishes her luck dealing with the snakes there. Then Lazar arrives after receiving a message from Tayuri, informing that Prince Roost won't be able to attend due to the attack from Cusco. In his place, his younger sister, Princess Cecilia, will come today. According to reports, the mages of Cusco set fire to a city near Farsa's border. Given the facts, Oscar questions whether this would be an act of revenge considering that mages have always been persecuted by Tayuri. However, Tinisha changes the subject and takes the king's son to the balcony to ask him alone if he likes Nark, her dragon, because she's thinking of giving the creature to the prince. He likes the idea, so the witch transfers ownership of the winged beast him. Excited about this, Tinasha floats into the man's arms, who kisses her, and to her surprise, the witch doesn't pull away because according to her, it's good to shake things up. Some time later, King Kevin's party begins and Tinasha continues to complain about having to attend this event. While Oscar promises to keep her identity a secret, she understands but promises to blow the nobleman into pieces if she's introduced as his fiancé. When introducing himself to his father, Oscar congratulates His Majesty Kevin, the 20th King of Farsis, on his 53rd birthday today. Soon Cecilia, the Princess of Tayuri, appears at the party catching Oscar's attention, who laments the attack suffered by her nation. Cecilia emphasizes that they were just annoying mosquitoes and nothing more. Anyway, the Prince of Farces would like to know more about Cuskel and the invaders, and the princess would love to tell a story, but perhaps in a more private place. Meanwhile, Kevin thanks Tinisha for her presence, especially for breaking the curse on his son. The witch feels happy to fulfill her pact and announces that Oscar is now free to marry whoever he wants. Speaking of which, the prince appears in the corridor being dragged by the Princess of Tayuri, who gives a cynical glance to Tinasha. The king laughs at the situation, saying he can't control his son and his age, but confesses that he would prefer him to marry Tinisha. Taking a breath of fresh air, the witch is relieved that she can't even dance with the dress she's wearing. Suddenly, she looks ahead and sees Lanak. At the same time, Cecilia shows off to Oscar by saying that her dress took six months to be sewn, but the man is fed up with this talk. At this moment, Tinasha enters the room and asks the princess to leave, because she needs to discuss an urgent matter with Oscar. Cecilia is offended and questions who she thinks she is to speak to her like that. 
The prince explains that she is a trusted mage, while the princess orders her to leave, as she is just a mere servant. In response, Tinesha tells the princess to shut up and even calls her an imbecile. Having said that, Cecilia cowers and turns around. Without the presence of the shrew, Tinesha puts a drop of her blood behind the prince's ear and reveals that she should have died 400 years ago, so he couldn't fall in love with the dead, but rather freed himself from it and contemplate the future of this nation that depends on its future king. As she spoke these words, the witch was backing away. When Oscar tries to reach her, the witch stops the man and remembers when she broke Lucrezia's spell. Then, Lanak appears from a portal, praising the beauty of Eddie. Tinesha hugs the king tightly, happy to see him alive. Then, Lanak reveals that he created an entire nation called Kuskal, just for Addie to become queen. A nation built from the ruins of others. Oscar can't believe what he sees, while Tinesha lets herself be embraced by the king of Kuskal. Lanak notices that the other man present wields the Akashi sword and therefore needs to be destroyed. But Tinasha convinces him to leave Oscar aside because even though the sword is powerful, it's useless if the user is weak. Incredulous, the prince wants to know what's going on. So the witch rudely replies that their pact ends tonight because the curse has been broken. Oscar threatens to draw the sword, but Tinasha warns that any aggression against Lanak is an aggression against her. When the woman clashes her sword against Oscar's, he remembers the training with her in the tower and concludes that he is capable of killing the Blue Moon Witch, but still hesitates, giving Lanak the opportunity to take his beloved away through the portal he came from. The next day, the mages of Farsas mourn the departure of their mistress, as well as the impact it had on Oscar's mind. Speaking of which, the nobleman appears handing paperwork to Laser and telling him to take care of the rest. The servant asks where the prince is going and he informs that he's going to Lucrezia's forest. Lazar tries to prevent his master's journey, but he doesn't back down from his conviction. However, Lucrezia appears in the castle to spare the young heir the trip. Soon the Witch of the Forbidden Forest reveals that she also received an invitation to Kuskal, like Tinasha. Just like all the witches, she declined, but Tinasha's acceptance could cause problems across the entire continent. Aside from that, Oscar wants to know the nature of the relationship between Lanak and Tinasha, and Lucrezia explains that she has been searching for him ever since she became a witch. In a way, the Witch of the Forest is happy to see her friend find the one she has been searching for so long. However, Oscar thinks that man wasn't in his right mind as if he were in a dreamlike haze. Whether it makes sense or not, Lucrezia thinks that Oscar is feeling the pain of betrayal, but regardless, he declares that he will not give up on his future wife, so he will kill that guy and bring her back. If she wants to date another man, then he'll throw in the towel and let the woman flee. Lucrezia understands the noble motivation of the love-struck man, and therefore she's willing to reveal what Tinesha personally said to her, but only to the ears of those who are prepared to fight her to the death. Faced with the declaration, the mages don't know how to react until the prince orders the witch to move on. Before anything else, Lucrezia reveals that the true name of the Blue Moon Witch is Tinesha, as Maya Rira Eterna Tolder. Surprise, one mage comments that Tolder is the magical empire that was destroyed overnight 400 years ago, and Lucrezia, adds that Tinesha was a candidate for the queen of the empire. In Tuldare, the ruler was not decided by lineage but by pure power. Oscar questions what would become of the nation if some eccentric took the throne, and Lucrezia replies that this was the reason Tinesha was separated from her parents at birth. Their candidates are chosen for king and queen, and end up engaged to each other. The boy, Lanak, was the king's only son. However, his power didn't even come close to Tinesha's. Everyone thought the two would marry and Lanak treated Tinisha very kindly as if she were a sister five years younger. However, unbeknownst to them, the royal court was divided into two factions. The reformists, who supported diplomacy with foreign nations, and the traditionalists, who preached isolationism above all else. As this division grew, the king fell ill, so with the imminent death of the supreme leader, the reformists began to support Tinasha, while the traditionalists sided with Lanak. Since the woman had the right to the throne, the followers of the man devised a plan to turn the tables. This happened when Tinasha was 13 years old and one night she opened her eyes and saw Lanak taking her to the cathedral, where some men dressed in black tunics gathered around an altar. Then, Lanak affectionately places the girl on this altar and stabs her in the stomach several times with a sword. The servants around recite a spell while Lanak continues to stab the child. After that, a dark aura emerges from Tinasha's body and Lanak promises to surpass her with this power. However, that massive energy goes out of control and consumes the servants of the sanctuary, then Lanak disappears from there, leaving Tinasha behind. The dark energy explodes and multiplies in size with the girl at its center, and soon all of that gigantic sphere is absorbed into her body. When the magical whirlwind ended, somehow the girl's torn stomach had been healed, even though she felt unbearable pain for three days without stopping. 
After this event, Taldor had been condemned to ruins, and the magic that overflowed from that sanctuary absorbed the souls of those who died in the tragedy, spreading across the continent and turning into five magical lakes. Thus, this whole process was what turned Tinasha into a witch. After all this, she built a tower in the corner of what was Taldor's territory to live in, and since then, she has been searching for Lanak. Upon hearing the whole story, Oscar asks what she felt about him. In response, Lucrezia recalls that the witch temporarily sealed his defensive barrier in Lanak's presence, which certainly saved his life. Furthermore, she gave the dragon to the prince herself, meaning two gestures that are worth more than a thousand words. Be that as it may, this doesn't change Oscar's plans as he maintains his intention to kill Lanak and bring Tinasha back. Next, the king receives a letter from Cuskel, demanding the surrender of the other four great nations, Tairi, Caesar, Gandona, and Pharsis. An advisor recounts that a few days ago, Tairi marched with 10,000 men to Cuskel, but the army was decimated while only 50 enemy mages were defeated. With Tairi weakened, five cities of the nation were taken along with the lives of 5,000 people. Mysteriously, the buildings of these cities remained intact, while all the people simply disappeared, and apparently, this is the work of the Blue Moon Witch. Thus, King Kevin announces that the nations demand the bearer of Akashia to execute the witch. However, even though he is the only one capable of doing so, Oscar Farsis refuses to comply with such a request, believing that Tinasha and Kuskal are not working together. That said, the king rises angrily and questions if his son has been enchanted by the witch, as he speaks this way when the fate of the nation falls on his shoulders. Still, Oscar stands by his decision, so Kevin strangely regains his composure and releases his son to do as he pleases as long as he assumes the throne as king. Understanding his father's motivations, Oscar accepts the challenge. Far away, Tinesha reflects that as long as she remains a witch, the bearer of Akashia will be responsible for her death. Elsewhere, facing a red moon, Roast, Prince of Tayuri, agonizes over the prospect of a devastating defeat against the mages of Kuskal. Right now, the best course of action would be to gather all troops and assume personal command of the army. At that moment, the Blue Moon Witch appears unexpectedly, accompanied by two more mages. The prince draws his sword and hurls insults at her, prompting one of the companions, Triss, a mage from Kuskal, to question his behavior. However, Tinasha is pressed for time and asks Pamir to take Triss away. Then she informs Rus that everything will conclude in two weeks, thus he should postpone the march to Kuskal until then. Roost expresses offense at taking orders from a mere mage, and she uses the way she was addressed to explain the reason for Tayiri's downfall. The prince retorts that the power of mages disturbs the world of the one true deity, Eridurdia. With that said, Tinasha asks if the man has ever plunged a sword into the skull of a child, or burned alive a mother clutching her crying child, because Tayiri is the place that tolerated such acts. According to her, as the successor to the throne, Roost should know since he studies the nations of the world that 300 years have passed since the Age of Darkness and no nation as fiercely self-centered as his has survived. Then, before leaving, the witch remarks that the prince seems to be corroding his own entrails. Roost attempts to summon the witch to continue the conversation, but gives up upon seeing the expression on her face. Meanwhile, at the castle of Kuskal, the nation of mages, Lanak learns that the four great nations are pooling their forces, but in his opinion, this changes little. Next, he demonstrates through his magic how the map of the continent will appear when covered to its four corners by the spell, which is possible with Adi by Kuskal's side. Speaking of her, Lanak recalls that the woman was a good and obedient student, but is interrupted mid-sentence, invaded by a feeling of being in a dream. Tinasha assures him that the man is not dreaming and he knows that, but his body sweats as if unaware. Following this event, Tinasha converses with one of the mages of Kuskal, Renart, and remarks that all the witches on the continent are women because men's bodies, magically speaking, are unstable and cannot withstand for long. In other words, Lanak is experiencing the psychological effects of this. However, it is still possible to conjure a spell of continental levels. As planned, after all, Tinasha has that capability, though such a significant magic will certainly change things drastically. Meanwhile, a man eavesdrops on the conversation between the two. Back in Tayiri, the Farsa's delegation does not understand why they have been in that country for six days, with no negotiations progressing, and they consider this to be due to the overwhelming defeat they suffered on the plains of Azdra, forcing Tayiri to pick up the pieces, even though now the four great nations have gathered their armies. At this moment, Lazar arrives and informs Oscar that something has happened in Farsis. The prince emphasizes that several cities in the four nations are being attacked while they are stuck there. Finally, he wants to know if Tinasha has anything to do with it although no one can say. Next, it is Cecilia's turn to enter the room, and Oscar is no longer pleased with the local princess's daily visits. This time, Cecilia tries to assert her presence, claiming to have seen the witch whom the prince loves to be with, 
the Blue Moon Witch. Oscar doesn't want to believe that this woman has any relevant information about it, and she plays hardball after baiting, but soon reveals that Tinisha visits her brother, Roost, every night. Impatiently, Oscar instructs the princess to guide him to Roost's room, making the woman regret not taking the hair of farces seriously. In no time, Oscar was already inside the quarters of the Prince of Tiyuri, questioning with Akashia in hand whether it was this kingdom that asked him to execute the witch. Roos doesn't know how to react to the situation until Tinasha appears once again on the man's balcony, and Sue startles at Oscar's presence. The Prince of Farces extends his hand to his beloved, but the mages of Cuskull grab her by the arms, while Renner opens a portal to take the three of them back to their kingdom. The next day, during the organization of the nation's armies, Oscar complains that Prince Royce's stance has cost the Alliance a lot of time, besides expressing curiosity about this event that Tinasha said has passed. Lucrezia appears and informs that she checked all the cities and that it really seemed that all the people had disappeared, but it was a defensive barrier so that no one would notice the populations who still remain there. At the same time, the witch warns that Tinasha will not protect herself, so Oscar must be her shield. Meanwhile, in the leadership of the troops, General Caesar discusses with General Gandona that this is a hard story to swallow, until a man emerges in the middle of the army and introduces himself as Bartolo's chief mage of Cusco. The battalions draw their swords immediately, and the mage laments the aggression because he thought everyone would like to see their king extending his dominion throughout the continent, especially since Bartolo's himself is capable of guiding people along that path. The soldiers question who would be crazy enough to accept such a thing, but Oscar offers to go to Cusco only for the mage to teleport all the present men to their nation. Upon arriving there, Oscar looks around in his face with the very definition of an ambush. Dozens and dozens of sorcerers surrounding the trapped soldiers until Lanak appears and welcomes the visitors to the ruins of the Cathedral of Tolder. He then reveals that the reason for this meeting is for him to offer a proposal, emphasizing that the continent is filled with discrimination and cruel conflicts. Lanak's goal is to end this discord through unification, and if anyone disagrees with this measure, it will receive immediate divine punishment because soon he will receive the necessary power for it. Besides, he presents his fiancée, Atis. When exhibited in meeting Oscar among the visitors, Tinasha cannot help but react, so Lanak asks him what happened. The witch avoids the subject and questions the reason for the visits, so the king of Cuskull recounts that he won everyone to witness the final moments until the conclusion of the procedure. With that said, Tinasha understands the reason and conjures a throne for herself to sit on. At that moment, Lanak approaches and casts a spell that extends to the skies, causing light objects to levitate from the ground. Oscar focuses on thinking of a way to interrupt this process, while Lanak commands the first lake, Compassion, to be born, the first of the five that will be formed by the energy and magic of nature, along with countless human souls. With the magical union of these five elements, the wizard will be able to watch over the entire continent from wherever he is as well as control the weather itself as he wishes. He then inaugurates the second lake, Jealousy, and the third, Denial. Afterwards, he takes another step toward his plan by conjuring the fourth lake, Admiration, and lastly, the final lake, Hatred. With this, Lanak contemplates the dawn of a new era, in front of allies and those who claim to be his enemies, until Tinasha interferes and replaces the magical circle of the King of Cuskull with her own. She explains that she has been searching for Lanak all this time, and when she finally found him, she was so happy that she could have cried because she saw the wizard as someone truly necessary. For instance, when invoking the lakes, the man was the only one who knew their defined names. However, now it's time to free the souls of the citizens Lanak killed 400 years ago, who merge and were trapped by the magical lakes. Faced with this, Lanak questions whether Eddie will betray him again, and she laughs at the wizard's thought while beginning his punishment. The king orders his subordinates to eliminate the witch, so Renart and Pamira form a magical shield to protect Tinasha. The witch asks them to flee, but they know that protecting Tinasha in this case is like preventing the queen in chess from being taken off the board because only a piece like her is capable of sublimating the magical lakes, this spell so complex and gigantic. However, Bartolos, who remains loyal to the sovereign of Seskel, has nothing to do with it and knocks Pamira down with his magic, opening a hole in the shield that surrounds Tinasha. Taking advantage of this gap, the wizard unleashes another spell towards the witch, but this time it's Oscar who avoids the worst using the royal sword Akasha. With that done, Tinasha asks the prince to hold off the enemies for 10 minutes and Bartolos mentions with a certain disdain the legends he's heard about the swordsman wielding Akasha, so he begins to attack the bearer of the weapon. At the same time, Triss doesn't know what to do in the face of Tinasha's betrayal to the king of Cuskel, so he moves away from the conflict. Lanak orders the demons to be summoned, joining the wizards in battle against the four nations. Roost is violently harassed by a young wizard from Cuskull, who accuses the prince of killing his sister. 
Although he didn't do it personally, Roos knows that this is the consequence of centuries of crimes carried by Tayuri. However, Meridina knocks the child out and saves the noble's skin. Meanwhile, Renart and Pamra notice that Tinasha is casting a double enchantment of Tolder's coronation ceremony, a spell capable of freeing the spirits of Tolder invoked by its first ruler. Sylvia thought this was just a legend as it's not possible for someone to control all 12 high-level spirits at once. Witnessing this, Bartolos knows it's the end just when he has the chance to eliminate those who killed so many wizards. Nevertheless, he intends to go down fighting, so he strikes Oscar, his rival, with the powerful fire spell, but the knight is quick enough to surprise the wizard and end his life. Finally, Tanasha gathers the necessary power to free the spirits bound to Tulder by the ancient pact and the twelve gather after this long time and are ordered by the witch to annihilate her enemies, sparing those who no longer intend to fight. Just as quickly as they appeared, the spirits eliminate the forces of Kuskal in the blink of an eye and then evaporate. Faced with his defeat, Lanak kneels before Oscar and places all the blame for Tolder's demise on the Blue Moon Witch. Oscar emphasizes that Tinasha believed in the King of Kuskal to the end, so he wants to know what he felt when he gutted his former companion. Lanak can hold back and bursts into laughter because he felt nothing, seeing the girl as a mere tool. With that said, Oscar raises Akashia and delivers the final blow to the King of Kuskal. Afterwards, the magic used in the war begins to dissipate into the skies, forming a beautiful visual spectacle, along with the souls liberated by Tinasha. Despite the witch's support, General Gandona reminds the bearer Akasha that he has a duty, so Oscar approaches Tinasha. Renart and Pamira threaten to react, but the witch knows it's not hostility. Then Oscar asks Tinasha if she remembers what he said when she broke Lucrezia's spell. The woman nods yes, and Oscar threatens to draw his sword, but she faints in the process. A week later, she wakes up in front of the Prince of Farsis and doesn't understand why she's still alive. First, Oscar tells her that Prince Roos decided not to use force against Kuskal, leaving the region as an autonomous state for wizards. Then, as if it were nothing, he reveals that Tinasha is now officially engaged to him. Obviously, she wants to know what this story is about, so he explains that it was the only way to bring her alive to Farsis. After all, some wizards from Kuskal wanted to kill the witch and steal her powers. Either way, he asked the woman to fulfill her duty well in the remaining six months. Faced with this, Tinasha rebels at first but eventually yields to the circumstances. Meanwhile, in Tulder's treasure chamber, the wizards are enchanted by so many incredible and valuable items, and Tinasha wants to decide what they'll take to Farsis. Taking a look around the chamber, the witch finds an article she thinks she's seen before but can't remember when, so she decides to take it to the tower. At the same time, in Minera Fortress in the eastern part of Farsa's bordering Yarda, General Edgard informs Prince Oscar that there are no signs so far of unusual actions in the neighboring nations. As for the children in the courtyard, he explains that a nearby village was attacked by knights from a nomadic people called Itos a year ago, and they brought the survivors here. The woman caring for the children is the widow of the village chief, Els. Her husband died protecting her, and since then, she has never smiled. Speaking of her, Els tells the children the story of her village, which was in the pastures long ago where a very beautiful girl lived. Several young suitors courted this girl, but she refused them all. One day, this village was attacked by evil men on a horseback, who set fire to all the houses to kill everyone there. That's when a swordsman, dressed in blue, appeared, drove away the men and saved the girl from being kidnapped. Moved by this deed, the girl asked the swordsman to marry her, but he refused and disappeared without a trace. Upon hearing the story, the children are enchanted by the swordsman, and quickly start playing with swords. Right behind them, Tinasha approaches the woman and confesses to being curious about the story just told. Els reveals that this is a true tale from 200 years ago in her village. The swordsman in blue was actually the son of the girl he saved, meaning the legend goes that he came from the future, being the woman's daughter with a nomad who kidnapped her at that time. According to legend, the swordsman traveled back in time to alter his mother's cruel fate, even if it meant he wouldn't be born because of it. Finally, Els asks Tinasha what she would do in this case, and she responds that she wouldn't change the past. A little later, Oscar comments to Tinasha that she never ceases to amaze him, because while they were granted only one room, he didn't expect to see her turning into a cat. But for her, it's perfect to share one room, because that way she can keep an eye on whether the prince sneaks out at night. Soon we see someone dead and spilling an obscene amount of blood in front of a man with bright green eyes. Oscar wakes up to the noise Tinasha makes, and she explains that she fell into a deep sleep and tuned into a corresponding dream frequency. In other words, someone in this fortress transmits a dream with strong emotions when they sleep, someone with great magical power who never learned to control this gift. This dream is always about someone that person hates and can't forget. 
The next day, Oscar goes out to analyze the territory and comments that the neighboring country, Yarda, is becoming more desert-like every day. Then he proceeds to visit all the villages. However, he finds himself surrounded by several archers in an ambush. Still, the prince asks the witch not to act. Meanwhile, a man who calls himself Javi steps forward from the archers, proclaiming himself the leader of the Aitos and making it clear that Oscar has something he wants. Oscar doesn't yield to the pressure and responds that he won't negotiate with bandits, which offends Javi because this way of life is what supports their families, enjoying the law of the jungle, which is a source of pride for the organization. That said, he reveals that he's looking for the woman who tried to kidnap him a year ago, and with her as the prize, Javi will have a duel against Oscar on the plateau of the Red Rock. Arriving there, the leader of the bandits explains that this land is sacred to them because, according to legend, a god visited this place long ago. However, the name of this god was lost. Attentive to the story, Tinnusha feels something very strange about the place, so she suggests that Oscar take this duel to the castle's training ground through her teleportation. However, the prince imagines that the opponent won't accept such a request and dismisses the possibility of making this invitation. Then Oscar tells Javi that if he wins this duel, the Idos will never be allowed to raid Farce's lands again. If they disobey this condition, Oscar presumes the Idos can imagine what will happen. At this moment, Elsa arrives at the scene and identifies the man who killed her husband, Javi. Without remorse, Javi makes it clear that he came to fetch the woman for himself and soon the duel begins. Despite his talent with the sword, the leader of the Idos was unable to hold off the Prince of Farce's onslaught for long, and after a few seconds of combat, he cuts off the enemy's arm. Thus, Oscar demands the fulfillment of the promise, while Javi calls Elsa's name, who remembers the man in her dreams. Strangely, the woman goes to the loser as if consoling him. Oscar asks Hinosha to put the victim's arm back, but she refuses, so he insists she at least stop the bleeding, which she does with some reluctance. Suddenly, a tornado engulfs Javi and Els, so the witch hurries to teleport everyone else to avoid leaving them in danger. Left only with Oscar, Tinasha thinks of a way to stop this tornado until a rift opens in the ground and a mysterious being flies out of it into the sky. Oscar throws his royal Akashi sword and destroys the creature, causing new cracks in the ground. Tinasha falls into one of these holes and Oscar wastes no time diving into the same place to go after his beloved. The prince manages to catch the woman in time and holds onto her until they both fall into the water below. However, despite saving the woman's life, her cat form makes the water not inviting at all, and getting completely soaked causes great stress to the animal. Oscar reminds her that she can return to being human any time, so she realizes and returns to her original form. Walking around that place, neither of them has any idea where they've landed, and Tinasha observes that she has suffered some kind of external magical interference, some kind of earth power that attacked her body's magic, as if reviewing the witch's insides. A little further ahead, Tinasha discovers that this is the sacred land of the Aitos, and the drawings are stories of this society engraved on the walls. Among these drawings, there was the representation of the mysterious god who appeared to them just now. According to the scriptures on the wall, this northern deity found and killed the evil beings among humans. Everyone thanked this deity, but the fear they felt for it led the Aitos to build this place for the god to rest. According to the witch, evil beings is a pejorative term for wizards, used at the beginning of the Dark Ages. At that time, wizards were not treated as humans. It seems that this god reacted to magic and revealed the wizards, so the Edos found it quite useful. Faced with the facts, both Tinesha and Oscar believe that this divine being is Iridurdia, the only true god of Tayiri, and responsible for the persecution of sorcerers. With that in mind, the witch is worried that the Prince of Pharsis is without Akashia at this crucial moment, but to avoid being teleported back to his kingdom, the man grabs any sword and continues the journey. Soon they were following some path until a black fog attacks them, forcing Tinesha to form a protective shield. Oscar asks the woman to retreat if she reaches her limit while he himself advances through the black fog, where he finds Els in the middle of the way. Without hesitation, Els throws a sword at the prince who parries the blade, but this blade dissipates in the air as if it were part of the fog. For this reason, Oscar believes that the woman has been possessed by Iridurdia. Then the entity lets out a terrifying scream and seems to absorb the fog around it, so Oscar hurries to try to stop it with his sword. However, Elves dissolves the knight's blade until Tinasha arrives at the scene with a strong nausea because as half of her magic was acquired after her birth, she is more easily affected by this environment. Unlike Oscar, whose magic was sealed. The man doesn't understand what that means and promises to ask later because now they need to do something about this god without hurting Elves. Tinasha is pessimistic about this because she considers it impossible to destroy what is inside the woman's body without hurting her. After all, maybe that figure carved on the wall was also a possessed human. 
Either way, first of all, Oscar needs to find Akashia again because surely that sword will have some effect against Eriturdia. Seeing his weapon at the bottom of that cave, Oscar questions whether a strike from that blade can't kill Els and Tinasha confirms that it can, but everything will be worse if the entity escapes from there. At this moment, Javi arrives and assures that he will not allow Els to die. So Tinasha argues that if she surfaces in this way, those with magic will end up dead just by getting close to her. Moreover, the appearance of such an entity will certainly provoke a violent reaction from the wizards, which can endanger everything around. Finally, if Javi is not able to understand this, the witch will have to kill him too. Even though she doesn't care who the woman is capable of killing, Javi begs the witch to save her, but the sorceress sees no choice but to end it all. With that in mind, she asks Oscar to kill her if she becomes a threat to the world. The man assures that he would do that, but only if this condition is irreversible. Happy with those words, Tinasha affirms that it's because Oscar is like that that she keeps fighting. Having said that, she kisses the knight's forehead and swallows a small silver sphere. Oscar runs after Akashia, which makes Els react violently. At the same time, the witch reveals to Eriturdia that it was she who awakened the entity, which was previously inside an ancient seal, until it reacted to a magic from the witch and woke up possessing this woman's body. As a mage of this continent, the Blue Moon Witch announces that she will be the opponent of this being that has brought chaos to the world. Eriturdia tries to attack the witch until Javi grabs the god from behind, giving the witch an opportunity to absorb Eriturdia into herself. After that, Tinasha reveals that the sphere she swallowed is responsible for keeping the entity inside her body, and then she asks Oscar to cut her stomach. The man resists as much as he can before such a request, but in the end he gives in and draws his sword, affirming that Tinasha is the only one for him. Finally, the witch confesses that she has wanted to end this god for a long time, so she asks the knight to move on. With that said, Oscar pierces the woman's belly with Akashia. Sometime later, Tinasha wakes up in her bed after a great recovery, and the prince tells her that Els received treatment and was left in the ruins of the village being able to return to Minaret Fortress, if that's her will. With that, Tinasha sprawls across the bed from exhaustion and Oscar questions if she will really sleep in her human form because of discretion. However, the witch is tired of curling up like a ball when she turns into a cat, so she wants to stretch her arms and legs a bit. Besides, she knows that Oscar has great self-control, so she's not at risk of anything by lying down with him. In a playful tone, Oscar warns that one day she will get into trouble for thinking like that. Soon the witch fell asleep and the prince asserts that he will protect this woman no matter what happens. Then he kisses the girl's cheek, who doesn't know how to react but soon smiles at the young prince. The next day over tea, Lucrezia mentions she heard Tinasha was reckless again. The Blue Moon Witch doesn't think it was a big deal. Indeed, being stabbed by Akashia is concerning, but Eridurdia vanished, and that's what matters. Above all, she knew Oscar could handle it. Speaking of which, Lucrezia wonders what's next, since her pact with the prince was only for a year. Seeing Tinasha avoiding the question, the forest witch advises her not to do anything she'll regret later. In another part of the castle, two nobles discuss the possibility of Tinasha becoming the future queen of the realm, and how she would be the most beautiful woman to be crowned in farces. On the other hand, a man listening disagrees, stating that woman is a witch. Norman, a civil servant of Farsus, believes there are many other candidates and it would be terrible to bring a sorceress into royalty. One of the men acknowledges that she is indeed a witch, but she's the queen of Tolder, but Norman counters that nation doesn't even exist anymore. Suddenly, Tinesha herself appears in the corridor, but Norman doesn't back down, going further to say that as long as the prince is obsessed with her, this kingdom will never have a queen. Speaking of which, he hopes the woman fixes the mistakes she caused in this nation. Calmly, Tinasha replies she could erase Oscar's memory, but it should be done without him finding out, so the men around interfere to say that's excessive. Finally, Norman is pleased to see the witch knows her place and leaves. Pamira is outraged by that guy's arrogance, but Tinasha herself reassures the mage from Cuskel. After all, she understands that witches are seen as calamities in the world, so she expects them all to be hated. Later, talking alone, Pamira comments Tinasha is very tolerant, but she disagrees, she just tries to remember who she really is. Then the mage asks if that thing about erasing the prince's memory was true, and Tinasha confirms it was. Because even if he forgets who she is, at least she'll still remember, and Oscar can go back to having a normal life, being the strong man he is. Besides, Tinasha thinks the prince is stronger than her, and she doesn't even understand how she's still alive. That said, Pamela sees a self-deprecating discourse in the witch and argues with her, saying that if she intends to die, she should live among people and die as a human. In response, Tinasha hugs the mage, who makes it clear she's only worried about her friend and wants her to be happy. The witch replies she is happy, while drawing attention to the beautiful starry sky of Pharsis. Then reflecting Oscar's image on the moon using an orb, 
Tinnersher comments that maybe a year was too long a period. After that, she pays a visit to the prince and shows the sphere she had just used, a gift to be appreciated, the capture of the sky in a frame. After thanking her, Oscar asks if everything is okay with the woman because she seems a bit sad. While saying she's fine, she tries to conjure something hidden, but Oscar notices and grabs her hand. With nowhere to escape, she admits she was testing a psychological spell. Oscar makes it clear he should be notified of any such matters, then insists again that the woman is not okay. So she confesses she's been thinking a lot about life and some things are bothering her. That said, Oscar said she should marry him and stop being a witch, aging normally beside him. Tinasha is very important to him and he doesn't want to miss the chance to spend his life with the one he loves. Expressing his feelings, he kisses the sorceress, who asks the prince to stop doing that. He says she should reject clearly if she doesn't like it, so she admits she's already accustomed to his touch, and it's for things like this that Oscar is also special to her. With that, they hug and were about to kiss again, but Laser appears knocking on the door like crazy. Angry, Oscar answers the servant impatiently, who apologizes for bothering so late. But before saying why he's there, the boy sees Tinasha in the room and realizes he's in trouble while Oscar confirms the guy can't even complain if he's killed because of this. Shortly after, Tinesha sees a winged creature flying over the skies, until an explosion occurs in the middle of the city, breaking the magical barrier of the castle. The soldiers begin the first defense movement led by General Els, who orders the troops to divide into groups of three men. In the meantime, Norna was about to be killed, but Tinesha casts a spell that eliminates the enemy, saving the man. Tinesha asks if he's hurt, and he awkwardly replies he's fine. As the woman prepares to leave, Norman draws her attention again and wishes her good luck, asking her to take care of his majesty. With that in mind, the witch summons five individuals, Sen Kerr, Mila, Nil, and Kumai. The five present themselves for battle and fight against the threat and farces, while Tinisha recites conjuring verses that provoke rain around the city. Downstairs, Oscar fought alongside the people, thanking for the rain that prevented possible fires. One of the castle maids was in danger, so the prince offers his hand to help her up, the girl thanks him, and upon touching the man, causes an instant reaction in him, making him drop Akashia and faint. Then the maid rises and reveals herself to be Adoreya, Leonora's servant. Making her way through the enemies, Tinasha reaches the fallen man and tries to save him using magic. Later, after repelling the enemies, she lays the prince on a bed to continue his treatment before summoning Lucrezia, Als, Kevin Farsis, Pamira, and Sylvia. First things first, the Witch of the Forbidden Forest advises her friend to stop time, which she had already done so she assumes that Oscar is being poisoned by a natural toxin, Alcacia. When Tinisha confirms, she decrees that the man is a lost cause, because this substance is deadly, and no one who has contracted has ever been cured since the Dark Ages. Despite this, Tinasha will not give up trying, so she plans to create a blood serum using her own body because it contains a lot of magic and time stands still within it. This means she can withstand the poison for a whole day. During this time, the witch will use her magic to create antibodies, Lucrezia warns that the woman will not be able to act as she intends in the face of the debilitating pain of the poison, but that's exactly why Tinisha wants help from the other witch. Lucrezia refuses to help and considers that the Blue Moon Witch is losing her mind because of this man, questioning if it's really worth risking her own life because of him. Without hesitation, Tinisha responds affirmatively. Therefore, the Forest Witch asks for assistance from Sylvia and Pamira. After a while, Lucrezia receives a test tube and a needle, stating that this has never been done before, so she doesn't know how long it will take, risking Tinisha's death before completion. With this in mind, she asks the Tower Witch not to lose her sanity because the blood flow going haywire will ruin the whole process. In response, Tinisha understands and asks that the spell be continued even after her death, and that all memories Oscar has of her be erased. On the other hand, Lucrezia refuses to erase the memories, insisting that the prince should live the rest of his life carrying that burden. That said, she pricks her friend's finger with a needle. In the next scene, Oscar wakes up confused in the presence of several companions, being told that he was sick and bedridden. The prince feels his mind as if it were filled with fog, as if something were missing inside it or someone. Laser suggests that it's just an impression and changes the subject, offering food to the master, but he refuses and goes back to sleep. However, instead of resting, Oscar picks up the orb on his bedside table and stares at it in the sunlight's reflection through the window. Norman passes by the corridor at that moment, so the prince takes the opportunity to ask if he knows anything before he got sick. Putting that question aside, the civil servant asks his majesty if he has already decided who he will choose as queen because it should be someone who meets the requirements. That said, Oscar is invaded by an image of Tinasha in his mind with her voice calling out to him. Guided by intuition, he passes through one of the castle walls, finding Lucrezia on the other side. 
Already knowing that not even God can get that witch out of this man's head, he shows Tinashe lying unconscious in bed. The alkakia that poisoned Oscar has spread throughout her body, and it's a mystery that she hasn't died yet because the extreme pain should have driven the woman insane, but she managed to recite the incantations to the end. Seeing a strange mark on her body, Oscar tries to lower the sheet to check, but Lucrezia stops him, saying that no woman would like to be seen that way. At least Oscar tries to find out if she became like this because of him, but Lucrezia hesitates to answer. Soon the prince insists and pulls part of the sheet off the victim, revealing marks and deep bruises all over her body. Faced with this, he embraces Tinasha with great care. Sometime later, the Blue Moon Witch wakes up in the same bed, accompanied by Lucrezia, who promises to heal her friend's wounds. After doing so, Tinasha visits Oscar in his office and claims to be fine. Oscar asks her to undress for him later, so he can see if indeed all the wounds have been healed. That said, the witch asks what's on his mind, and he returns the same question to her. After all, he wants to know if he's just a participant in a pact, or if it means something more than that. Then Tinisha responds that despite the pact, he is important to her. Oscar laughs and says the woman should think a little more about things. Later, the witch meets with some friends from the kingdom and vents about the way the prince insists on this marriage issue. Respectfully, Renard also asks Tinisha to reconsider this request because surely she would never do it for anyone else just because of a mere pact. Thus, there is no doubt that the prince is special to her, maybe including an attraction between them. Hearing this, the witch breaks cold and asks who there thinks she loves Oscar by chance. When everyone raises their hand, Tinasha loses it completely, as if it were utterly absurd for anyone to think that way, so she casts a spell that breaks the table in half. Faced with the facts, Lucrezia suggests that her friend try to be a little more honest about her own feelings. In fact, she is sure that the Blue Moon Witch has loved that man for a long time and finds it ridiculous for her not to realize it or pretend she doesn't know. Attacked from all sides, Tinasha puts her hand on her conscience and questions if she actually loves Oscar. Upon reaching a conclusion, she affirms that the only alternative left is to kill him if that's the case. Without delay, she returns to Oscar, who was holding the orb she gave him. So she states that she asked everyone around her to find out one thing, wanting to know if she happens to be in love with him. Not quite understanding, Oscar finds humor in the witch's lack of social tact and then confirms that the feeling is real. So he asks the woman to come closer as she embraces her beloved. Oscar asks why she's crying, but she herself doesn't know. Anyway, she feels happy to have met Oscar, and this time she kisses the prince with conviction, unlike all the other times. At night, the two are together in bed and Tanasha realizes she needs to use much more spiritual power to invoke magic now. Oscar asks when the ceremony will be where the witch will have the privileges of the royal family of Pharsus, however the woman does not seem very happy with this conversation. In her mind, just being Oscar's lover would be enough, but the prince doesn't want to hide her from the rest of the kingdom. As dawn breaks, the two are already performing their daily tasks, while Tanasha questions Oscar if the New Year festival is held in the Eastern Temple, and he says yes, and it's customary for him to go by horse to present himself to the people. Suddenly Latola appears in the prince's office informing that there are visitors in the tower. Despite being closed, five boys under ten years old are trying to get in there, and from the conversation, it seems they are residents of Pharsus. Meanwhile, at the tower's entrance, the rascals are mocking one of them say because the kid doesn't have the courage to try to open the door. Tanasha appears at the same time to scold the guys, so they say they came to ask the Blue Moon Witch if it's true that in the north it rains ice instead of water. They are sure it's a lie but Say said it really happens. Tanasha asks if they're talking about snow then Say confirms that's exactly it. The witch questions what would happen if the boys encountered bandits along the way, but Say replies that the king became strong facing challenges on his journey, so she teaches that the king went through a whole training before embarking on any adventure and then opens a teleport to take the boys back. Over the days, Tanasha casts a surveillance spell that covers the entire territory of the kingdom, although she notices absolutely everything that happens in that area, and this feeling is very unpleasant. By the way, she remembers the day those boys tried to invade the tower, saying their audacity reminds her of someone. Ignoring this issue, Oscar asks why Tanasha doesn't want to marry him, so she reveals that he has a lot of magic within him. Therefore, she believes that all that power 
was sealed inside him when he was just a child. So if she has a child with Oscar, undoubtedly he will be a powerful wizard. On the other hand, if it's a girl, the chances of her being a witch are very high. A boy would inherit a lot of magic of course, but as long as he wields the Akashia, he won't be able to use spells. That's probably why Oscar received this sword so early, given that Tanasha believes that Oscar's father knew about his son's magic, and that maybe it was his mother who sealed everything inside him. Be that as it may Oscar insists on the marriage issue, asking his beloved not to reject his power reminding her how many people she has already saved with it. Likewise she remembers that she has taken countless lives with this ability so Oscar argues that he has done the same, and that happens to those who make the decision to fight. In fact Tanasha, and he could teach their children about these powers but also about the value of life so that they are better than their parents. That is provided they at least have the chance to be born. Soon on the day of the festival Oscar parades through the city with Nark on his shoulder, while Tanasha occupies another horse. In the midst of the crowd, the impressed Say thinks about doing something mischievous. Following the celebration at the kingdom's temple, the king is cheered as he performs the usual gestures of the celebration with his beloved in the background far from everyone. On the way back from the event in the middle of the road Oscar and Tanasha notice that someone was watching Farces's convoy, so the witch summons lightning to make the imposters flee. Except of course Say who happened to be eavesdropping everything behind a tree, so the woman tells him to leave reminding him that she already lectured him before about these things. Say asks forgiveness from the witch and his majesty, while Tanasha tells the others to appear too putting them all on horses to take them home. Say who was on the blue moon witch's horse asks how she was able to find out they were there, and she replies that she's always alert to everything. Right at this moment a heavy rain starts to fall. Taking advantage of this moment Tanasha invokes a spell that turns the water into snow leaving the children impressed with what they're seeing for the first time. In fact Oscar also finally discovers what snow is, and this additional feat makes the king realize that the world has much to offer when he's with the one he loves the most. Later after arriving in farces Oscar picks Tanasha up, while his suitor asks for some time to think better about this marriage issue until the pact between the two ends. The king understands and then informs that he asked his father about his mother, and he said that Oscar should do as he pleases since he also got married for his own reasons. Anyway, the new king feels happy to be alive because now he can be with his beloved who responds feeling the same. Meanwhile, Leonora the witch who cannot be summoned asks her servant how Tanasha was. The man says her spells seem different so Leonora imagines she may have yielded to a man which is reckless considering the life-threatening situation she recently went through. Be that as it may, Leonora intends to kill Tanasha if she's being careless. A day later, like Kaisar informs that they will receive details about the celebrations of Gandona's Foundation Day in two weeks. Oscar complains that he doesn't want to go because he's worried about the problems in Yarda in the east but he has no choice. So besides Tanasha, the king decides to take Pamira and Sylvia to help his beloved get dressed. Tanasha asks what's up with that because she can very well dress herself but Oscar warns that it's a formal dress so it's a different story. The witch remembers that she's only going as an escort not a parade but Lazar points out that everyone considers her his majesty's bride. Faced with this, the woman begins to dislike the idea of going and Oscar lets her stay as long as she informs where she'll be during that time. A little later the couple was chatting about this city Gandona, and the witch tells that she was once summoned to exterminate a demon in that region. Speaking of which, if something goes wrong, she asks her beloved to call her by her name. As for her, she will stay nearby somewhere Oscar can see her. So finally comes the day Day of the celebration of Gandona's Foundation Day and Tanasha as always is isolated from the rest of the crowd. Suddenly a man arrives offering drinks to the woman and Tanasha knows it's Travis a higher demon, so she mentions that he already knows she doesn't drink. Travis comments that the witch has become a beautiful woman and wants to know if this is due to her finding a man. However she responds that it was exactly the opposite. She matured because she was deeply hurt. Travis jabs saying that she got hurt even though she 
has so much power, especially considering the fragility of humans. Speaking of which, he acknowledges that if this human Tanasha desires were a woman, he would desire her too. So the witch gets tired of the twisted conversation and asks why the demon is there. He reveals that he is a duke in this country now, and he's after a woman. Tanasha feels sorry for the poor girl while finding amusement in the ladies showing off for Oscar downstairs. Travis emphasizes that the blue moon witch has softened too much lately. Therefore, he bets he could kill her now. Tanasha asks if he wants to try, but the higher demon doesn't want to cause trouble in the middle of such a beautiful party. Speaking of trouble, a woman arrives scolding the man saying he's flirting with women again. Travis argues to this damsel Oralia that Tanasha is a member of the Gandona royal family and he's acting as her guardian. Not buying into this talk much the girl apologizes for the guy's behavior and introduces herself as Oralia Canal from the Gandona royalty. The witch also states her name which makes Oralia realize she is the bride of the king of farces. Travis pretends that he and the king are old acquaintances and comments that a child of this couple must be quite interesting. Tanasha retorts that it's precisely because she's not interesting that there's doubt about the marriage. Travis says that witches fear their children will be like them so Oralia laments this but believes that even if this child suffers in this world, surely this child would choose to be born to experience the sorrows and wonders of this world. That said, the damsel apologizes for being invasive in her words before leaving in embarrassment. Tanasha found this woman exceptional and Travis explains that this is due to the fact that she has a strange power she never asked for. Hours later, Tanasha washes Oscar's hair during his bath while he mentions that the princess of Yarda disappeared before reaching the Gandona border. There were internal conflicts in the royal court and some members are even preparing for a war like the prince. That said, he pulls Tanasha into the bathtub and says he saw her talking to a man earlier who claimed to be a duke but had a strange aura so Oscar questions if he is indeed human. Tanasha is impressed that Oscar noticed this as this is a perception for few so she explains that that man is high ranking among demons also known as the Demon King. It was this creature that Tanasha was called to exterminate in Gandona some time ago. Oscar says the two seem to be getting along well so the woman replies that the demon is not interested in witches and actually seemed more interested in Oscar. After that moment already in the middle of the night, the king hears a window being shattered and gets up in a hurry. Inside the castle Owls fights against several demons alongside his men until the king arrives and joins the defense force. To add to the resistance Tanasha arrives a little later with a towel casting a spell that clears the enemies from the corridor. Owls turns away to avoid seeing the future queen dressed like that while the king scolds her for it. Without hearing the sermon the witch hears a sinister laugh somewhere and teleports there trapping a witch with her magic. When interrogated the unknown witch reveals that she came to fulfill orders from her mistress but doesn't say who it is. Tanasha decides to kill the intruder but she is saved at the last moment by an ally who flees through a portal with the witch. At the same time Travis also bites the dust in this situation because he was after the man who fled after trying to kill Oralia. Now changing the subject the demon asks what's with the new outfit so Tanasha realizes she's going to get a scolding from Oscar. The next day the king of farces is informed that the prime minister of Gandona was killed along with other victims and it seems Tanasha is included in the list of suspects. The witch regrets not being able to stop her target but anyway she has an idea of who might have been the mastermind behind this scheme. It's Leonora the witch who cannot be invoked because that explains why Oscar and Oralia are the targets. After all this witch was treated cruelly by Travis in the past and in a battle between the two one day Tanasha said very unpleasant things to Leonora. That is she must hold a great grudge against these events and this witch is quite powerful capable of building and destroying nations with her numerous servants manipulating nobilities and royalties. In fact she was responsible for involving that amber castle which started a great legend. At the moment Leonora is scheming in Yardas so they fear that Farsus is the next destination. Surely she's behind these internal conflicts in royalty so they decide it would be important to contact the forces opposed to the prince of the region. Some time later in the western region of Yarda, they arrive at the place where the princess of Yarda disappeared in the midst of a sandstorm at Kato Fortress. Finding her inside the noblewoman of the region introduces herself as Nefeli Yarda alongside her servants Gate and Luzef. First of all Oscar makes it clear that Farsus has no intention of making their intervention public and hopes the princess can do the same. That said he states that the woman who flattered the 
prince is a witch and that he is the ideal option to kill such a being. Frightened the princess questions what a witch wants with them so Tanasha explains that Leonora is the witch who cannot be summoned therefore she always appears when she is not invited. In other words the people of Yarda were simply unlucky. To lure this witch the travelers from Farces bet that Leonora will know about the contact between Tanasha and the princess of Yarda and will certainly appear. To ensure this happens they need to get rid of the sandstorm. According to Tanasha Leonora has a short fuse which makes her an easy rival to defeat but Oscar believes his contender also isn't a paragon of patience. Putting that aside the blue moon which also dealt with some members of Yarda's royalty because just killing Leonora won't be enough to avoid a civil war. That's why Tanasha teleported the faction leaders to the borders well isolated sealing the mages powers and putting the armies out of service with a powerful laxative. Moreover the king fell ill due to the potions and she cured him. Additionally she spoke with Prince Sava's Nefeli's brother. As he seems remorseful for his actions it appears he will hold off on the offensive. With that said Tanasha states that Leonora will meet her end in Yarda. At night Oscar worries about the spirits being able to deal with the demons there so Tanasha explains that she gave them a vote of confidence as they claimed they would handle it. Later the king asks about the past battle between Tanasha and Leonora and his beloved replies that she won back then. Speaking of which she says Oscar must take care of Anai in this battle. A man Leonora made absorb a demon giving him supernatural physical strength. Without hesitation the king asserts he will win easily. Besides that he demands that Tanasha stop acting alone and in response she claims she cannot forgive those who tried to kill Oscar. With that the king of farces kisses the woman and begins to lower his head to more intimate parts, but she reprimands him saying there's a right time and place for that. Insisting a bit more Oscar argues that they might die tomorrow so there's no better time. When dawn breaks again Nefeli can't believe the sandstorm disappeared so easily while Tanasha still sleepy warns that Leonora should arrive within an hour. To let the tower which rest Oscar asks her to lie down and requests Pamira to keep an eye on her. Meanwhile, the witch who cannot be summoned awakens her fury upon discovering that the sandstorm has dissipated so she summons Unai and orders that Tanasha be killed immediately. After taking a bath Tanasha claims she's fully awake now making it clear that she doesn't feel well when woken up by someone else. However Pamira reminds her that even if she hadn't slept with her, she would have woken her up at some point because that's her duty. Suddenly the princess of Yarda arrives to accompany the bath with two maids and looks strangely at the witch. Pamira suggests it must be the neck so Tanasha nullifies her marks with magic. Impressed Nefeli asks if the witch intends to manipulate the king of farces just as that other sorceress manipulated her brother. Realizing the implication the princess quickly apologizes but Tanasha responds that Oscar doesn't listen to anything she says so it's probably he who's in control of the situation. Speaking of the king the witch asks directly if the princess of Yarda desires him for herself and she lowers her head without answering. Faced with this Tanasha analyzes that if the witches hadn't interfered Nefeli could have become the queen of farces. After all if the silence which hadn't cast that curse on Oscar, if Leonora hadn't provoked a civil war, or if Tanasha herself hadn't been involved perhaps these humans lives would have been quite different. Thinking about this Tanasha realizes that witches play too much with the fates of men. In an old memory Leonora calls called Tanasha a pathetic child for not wanting to touch or be touched by anyone. According to her witches have the power to live as they want and should use it to be free. Deep down Tanasha never imagined that one day she would be desired by a human and that she could develop to the point of facing Leonora. Speaking of which exactly one hour has passed so the time has come. She then leaves the bath and reunites with Oscar who was observing the war from atop Kato fortress. Suddenly she ties a ribbon from her hair onto the man and tells him to pull it if anything happens because the sensation will be passed to the ribbon on her arm and nothing more. Next Oscar proposes to Tanasha after the war and she accepts after all the times she refused. Incredulous the king questions if she's serious and she reaffirms with conviction leaving the rest of the members of farces speechless. With this confirmation Oscar assures that he can no longer be defeated so his future wife ironically questions if he intended to be defeated at any point. Then she can 
confirms that it's time for the war to begin. Mounted on Nark, the two ascend to the skies towards the eye of the storm where Leonora and Unai await their enemies. Without a second thought the blue moon which attacks her rival who dodges. Then she asks Leonora not to mind Unai because Oscar will take good care of him. In return Leonora provocatively says that a spiritual sorceress who lost her purity has no value in her words. However, Tanasha points out that this fact gave her the chance to organize her spells which she is eager to test. After all, she is a witch, and now lives as she wants as Leonora likes to say. So the tower guardian fires a magic arrow at her opponent, who regenerates instantly. Soon Tanasha realizes that she needs to deliver a more lethal blow. In the next battle Oscar slices Unai's arm, but the man acts as if he feels no pain gripping Akashia's blade as if it were made of rubber. On top of that he regenerates his arm in a demonic form, making it clear that anything Oscar tries will be useless. So Oscar decides to see if his opponent can prove his point. Up in the sky Leonora continues to taunt the younger witch saying that Tanasha has led a dull and domesticated life and thus lacks the strength of a true witch. To justify her claim she opens the ground beneath her causing a fierce storm and raising a strange pillar from the earth. Tanasha prepares to teleport Oscar away and save him, but then blood red butterflies appear flying around her followed by the castle of amber which emerges from the sand leaving tanasha stunned and questioning if leonora trapped all the humans inside next leonora conjures a spell so powerful that tanasha nervously creates her magic shield knowing the impact won't be light sure enough the spell is launched generating a cloud of smoke that completely envelops the blue moon which inside the castle of amber oscar wonders if the witch has done something but unai remains silent regardless the king knows he must show signs of life as soon as possible. Meanwhile, on the castle's throne, the uninvoked witch despises her enemy, saying she has led a miserable life over the past 400 years, softening to the point of falling in love with a human. With her left arm completely burned, Tanasha destroys the enemy's throne and vows to make her regret becoming a witch. Her desire to kill Leonora is so immense that it emanates an atmospheric pressure threatening to break the castle of Amber's structures. Even Leonora admits to being surprised by such power, something Thing she never expected from someone she has always despised. Suddenly, the ribbon tied around her arm is pulled reminding her of Oscar immediately. Picking up the ribbon from the ground, she declares she will set aside her hatred and defeat her rival with more calmness. A few seconds earlier, the king of Pharsus was fighting the human demon until he decided to pull the ribbon on his left arm, leaving Unai curious. Without satisfying his rival's curiosity, Oscar claims he knows what will happen but doesn't reveal it. Then to Tanasha appears by breaking through the ceiling, and the man concludes by saying he knew she wouldn't lose to anyone. Alongside the tower which Leonora descends and stands next to her servant visibly furious, seeing that the severe wound on Tanasha's arm hasn't healed her adversary comments on how much she has weakened, but Tanasha sees things differently. According to her Oscar was the person who motivated her to become a better person. When Unai steps forward to fight and Oscar responds in kind Tanasha warns, that Leonora regenerates quickly within the castle of Amber's domain so the battle must be as brief as possible. Leonora agrees as she doesn't intend to linger there and prepares a spell to kill Oscar. The fact that Tanasha placed herself in front to protect the human seems to have unsettled the witch who remains speechless. At the same time Oscar cuts off Unai's demonic arm and Tanasha gains an advantage over Leonora, even tearing her shoulder with her sword. After gathering her thoughts Leonora reaffirms that that any resistance is futile, but Tanasha is convinced the story is different. Thus Tanasha tests another of her eccentric spells, bringing down part of the ceiling and positioning herself among the debris. Skeptical about the effectiveness of these tricks, the older witch counters with a spell that envelops her opponent's body in blinding light, but Tanasha disappears and rematerializes in front of Leonora, seizing the opportunity to thrust her sword into her enemy's abdomen. Consequently, the uninvoked witch staggers and falls to the ground calling Unai's name. The servant meets the same fate as his master having been pierced by the rival witch's blade. As an unconscious impulse, she tells the man she will rest for a while closing her eyes and causing the castle of Amber to disappear along with the winged demons surrounding Yarda. Returning to Kado Fortress 
Travis Tanasha assures that everything is finished. Upon arrival, the witch asks Travis to reaffirm his oath, and he repeats that as long as there are descendants of Tanasha's bloodline, he will not lay a finger on Farsus. Seizing the moment, the superior demon asks what the witch plans to do now, and she responds that she will live the rest of her life and die beside Oscar. Sometime later, the Society of Farsus officially meets the king's wife, but Tanasha can't manage a smile during the celebration. Suddenly, Say appears running beside her carriage promising to become a soldier when he grows up to protect his queen and Tanasha says she eagerly awaits that day. Further ahead, we finally meet Lavinia, the Witch of Silence. Through telepathy, Tanasha asks if she came to kill Oscar and Lavinia replies that she came to check out his eccentric bride. At the church ceremony, Oscar confirms his marriage vows with Tanasha naming her Queen of Farsis. Likewise, Tanasha accepts the king as her husband offering her eternal love and the two kiss now officially married. She comments that she never imagined she would change her mind about this, and they both laugh about everything they've been through to reach this moment. Then she tells Oscar that she loves him.